Welcome to the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. The Falmouth Chamber is dedicated to working on behalf of our members to make Falmouth a better place to live, work, and conduct business. We are committed to developing the economic, cultural, educational, and civic interests of our community and welcome the support from all organizations to achieve our combined goals. Whether you call Falmouth home, are a summer resident, or a visitor, we hope you take advantage of all that the Chamber has to offer. People think that a locally owned and operated appliance store may not offer what they need. Actually, we have trained and dedicated sales associates, expert delivery and installation, professional repair service, and personal customer service. Plus, we have access to a huge local warehouse with over 6,000 models in stock. Crane Appliance. We call the Cape and Islands home. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. 508-548-7303 or toll free at 1-800-696-7303. Our email address is carlsonprinting at aol.com. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. Hosting services for fctv.org are provided by Meganet Communications. Meganet offers a wide array of internet services including Mega Backup Cloud Service, Server Colocation, T1, Fiber, Metro Ethernet, as well as telephone services such as hosted PBX and digital voice. Their number one goal is to keep your communications network up and running and allow you to focus on growing your business. 877-634-2638 or meganet.net. The Quarter Deck Restaurant, located on Main Street in the heart of Falmouth, specializing in fresh local seafood and other classic American cuisine, featuring a full bar with friendly staff, and the Bucatino Restaurant and Wine Bar, located in North Falmouth, just off Nathan Ellis Highway, featuring catering services with two full event rooms serving up classic Italian cuisine. The Quarter Deck Restaurant and Bucatino Restaurant and Wine Bar, we're here to serve all our friends in Falmouth.
Good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to the February 1st, 2021 meeting of the Falmouth Board of Selectmen. Uh, Family Select Board, excuse me. Um, and this meeting is being conducted remotely in accordance with uh, the orders from the governor that allows us to do so. We've been doing this since um, last spring. And for those who uh, may be joining us for the first time tonight, you are able to participate in real time uh, by going to the, uh, the Falmouth Select Board website and you can see how to log into this meeting as it's taking place. And you'd be able to join in and comment on an item on our agenda or make a comment during public comment. Uh, for those who don't feel comfortable doing that, um, please, as always, reach out to us in advance of our meetings. Um, and you can send us an email um, about any issue that's on the agenda that you want us to raise. And we can read those comments into the public record if you so choose. So many ways uh, to participate in this meeting. Um, and we wanna make sure that we continue to have public input um, at the same degree uh, that we are able to do when we meet in person. Um, so for tonight, let me call the meeting to order by um, calling your name and please uh, note if you're present. Uh, Nancy Taylor. Taylor present. Doug Brown. I'm present. Sam Patterson. Patterson present. Doug Jones. Jones present. Okay. Megan English Braga present. And we also have Julian Suso, town manager, uh, Peter Johnson Staub, assistant town manager, as well as uh, members from our IT department here assisting tonight. Um, if folks do log in and you'd like to comment, um, please make a note in uh, the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen so that we can try and get your comment um, you know, in at the appropriate time. Okay, um, if you would join me please for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Great. Good tonight. Thank you. That was pretty good. When we go slower, it seems a bit yeah. better. Um, okay. I noticed okay. in the chat that Senator Susan Moran is joining us this evening. Yes, hopefully we have um, Senator Moran here, as well as representatives uh, Dylan Fernandez and David Vieira. Um, and so we've invited them for part of our discussion on 151 um, safety issues. So I think that uh, they will all be joining us, hopefully. Great. Um, so first we'll start with the 100th birthday proclamation for Samuel N. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Brown, did you want to read that for us, please? Yes, ma'am, I will. Proclamation, whereas Samuel N. Johnson, a resident of Falmouth for 38 years, will be celebrating his 100th birthday on February 9th, 2021. Whereas Samuel N. Johnson was born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts on February 9th, 1921. Samuel is a World War II veteran, having served in the Navy V-5 program from 1942 until 1945 and held a service rank of EM2C. Samuel worked for General Electric as an engineer. Samuel married the love of his life, Betty, on May 5, 1945. Samuel has six children and many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Now, therefore, we, the select board of the town of Falmouth, Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, February 9th, 2021, as Samuel N. Johnson Day. In witness thereof, we, Megan English Braga, Douglas C. Brown, Douglas H. Jones, Samuel H. Patterson, and Nancy R. Taylor, have hereunto set our hand and caused the great seal of the town of Falmouth be affixed on this day, February 1st, 2021. Happy Thank birthday. you, and I... Thank you. And I thought I saw someone joining us, um, perhaps for this. I see a Trish W. We can't see you or hear you. I did. I did see. I am. Tr I'm Trish Wright. I am Samuel's next door neighbor, and uh, I wrote in for the proclamation. So I tried to Wonderful. him to uh, attend, but he's very humbled, and um, he is completely thrilled and very <laughs> well. Well, we we. Um, just, you know, we'll get this to him directly. So we'll, we'll make sure that he can um, have that to keep. And, you know, please um, just passing on our real thanks for his service. Um, just, you know, hearing, I'm sure that's just a small slice of 
Um, you know, no proclamation can really encompass all the things that someone does in 100 years. Um, so really, it's just a small slice. And what we heard is incredibly impressive. And, and we're really humbled that we get to share um, and, and, you know, just sharing a bit of his life with our community and recognizing him for all that he's done. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that we are having a um, celebration, you know, for uh, Sam on Saturday, June 13th at 1 p.m. over here in Fisherman's Cove, okay. about five doors up from the association. So we are having um, a giant parade and the um, Navy Honor Guards um, are going to lead it. You know, well, hopefully maybe the found police and fire will come. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. And, um, all of the residents that are down here are going to have a drive-by parade and everybody's Oh, that's wonderful. Yep. Oh, neat. And I think Sam's son, Peter, is on. Okay. okay. I don't see him on here, but maybe he's in the, the panelists. So uh, maybe we can, if, if Trish, if, if you take it upon yourself to, if you remind us if that actually takes place in oh. June, um, you know, maybe we, someone can read the proclamation or bring it to him and present it to him then if it's, uh, you know, safe to do so. It's February 13th. Oh, February 13th. Okay. Yes. So okay. like in two Saturdays at one o'clock, but I will definitely Diane and let them know. Yes. And then she can pass it on just to remind us. And then one of us can get, I'm sure one of us can be there to give him the proclamation. Oh, that would be great. Okay. Great. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. It was wonderful. So Thank I you. Take care. Yeah. Wish him a happy birthday. birthday. And we will. I see have Samuel a great night. was a uh, electrician's mate, and that must have been an important job to play that role in that V5 program. So thank you to Samuel. They're very important. It was great. Mr. Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd uh, remind the board on February 13th, you have a joint meeting with the planning board. So yep. uh, your schedules are um, hopefully it'll be con concluded uh, early, but one never knows. So I thought I should remind you as a courtesy. Uh, to Mr. Johnson and these fine folks that you may be a little compromised on time. We'll, okay. we'll figure something out. So. Well, awesome. We'll get our business done early. We'll take the planning board with us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you Thank go. you so much. What, what time of the day is it? 1 p.m. Yeah, it's before. Yeah. I figured it would be daylight. I can skip the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna, now everyone's going to be fighting to skip it, right? So to for something nice wonderful try. like that. <laughs> You'd love it meeting Sam. <laughs> Thank He's you, fabulous. Trish, so much. It's really Thanks. wonderful. Have a Thank great you. Night. You Thank too. You. Take Bye. care. Bye bye. Bye. Um, next, under um, recognition, um, just I, I know I speak on behalf of the whole board. Um, just an enormous. Thank you for all of the staff, IT clerk's office, the town staff that made um, town meeting possible last week. Our virtual town meeting really um, was so impressive. And for all the town meeting members who logged into those precinct meetings in advance to make sure they knew how to um, you know, raise their hand to, to bring a point of order or get into the, the um, you know, lineup to make a comment, it really was, um, pretty flawless given, you know, we had over 200 people logged in and participating in this meeting. Um, Mr. Brown, did you have any other um, No, I would just second that. that. I, and thanks to Ms. Uh, Moderator Vieira. He did a great job, kept it all in order. So I thought it went yep. really well. Yep, it was great. And, um, you know, I think people, you know, just were able to participate and share their concerns. There was some robust debate on a couple of items. Um, mm -hmm. So it didn't feel as if we missed out on having that conversation. Um, so hopefully the next time around will be just as smooth um, as we you know, continue to kind of live in this new world. So huge thanks to everyone who made that possible. It was a lot of work um, and you know, just really, it showed how much thought had gone into it. So it's good, it's good that we did it because we're gonna have to do it again, so. Yep. Yep. Can't under our belt. Forever. <laughs> um, announcements. Mr. Patterson, you had said that you had some. Yes, I do. Um, yeah. The first is uh, the Falmouth EDIC is reaching out to organizations and citizens to identify 250 low income households that can qualify for an estimated $300 per year reduction in their electric costs. This is actually in conjunction to the developer of that second phase of the solar array up on the landfill. So this is a benefit that's coming back to the town. If you qualify or an organization that can help identify eligible families, the point of contact is the Falmouth EDIC, and here's the phone number, 
508-548-7440. So that's 508-548-7440. Secondly is the same Falmouth EDIC, and they are combined with the Falmouth Chamber and also Open Cape have been uh, developing broadband services along the main street in Falmouth. Uh, they have built out 35, built services to 35 businesses and, and actually have finished the backbone all the way from Depot Avenue through Falmouth Heights Road. But only 35 businesses have signed up, but there's plenty more capacity and they have a grant money to offset the actual installation costs. So they're actually looking for businesses to contact them again. Well, in this case, you can contact the EDIC through that 508-548-7440, or you can contact the chamber or you can contact Open Cape through opencape.org uh, to, to actually get information as to whether your business qualifies to hook up to the Open Cape network. This is a fiber optic connection with a very large bandwidth. So it should service uh, even, you don't have to get, get the, the maximum supply of, of, of broadband services, you can have a lesser supply. So just call and find out just what the arrangements could be for you if you think it'll help your business. I think the important thing that's been demonstrated is this is a very reliable network. No more wait, holding your customers at bay while their credit cards are being processed. Mm -hmm. If you have large files that you're gonna transmit, they can go just in a fraction of a second. And then the video conferencing capability, which we have struggled with as a select board, uh, is flawless. And so I just want to mention that, that this is a superior service available to all those businesses located from Depot Avenue all the way to Falmouth Heights. The last of the announcements is just that uh, the CPC Beauty Preservation Committee needs assessment is going to be held on at 630 on March the 11th. Uh, they're going to have some restricted uh, applications based on need alone for the November town meeting. But this uh, is an opportunity to come before the CPC and basically say, here are needs that we know of that qualify under the Community Preservation Act funding restrictions. So that's March the 11th at 6.30 p.m. It'll be Zoom, of course. That's it, thank right. you. Thank you, Sam. Doug Brown, an announcement? So a couple, couple things. Uh, this week, the um, Barnesville County Assembly of Delegates meeting will be mostly an educational experience where uh, new assembly members and as well as the general public can learn how the assembly works and how county government works and uh, should be very interesting for anybody that wants to know more about that. So four o'clock Wednesday afternoon and just look on the Boxville County uh, website to get all the information if you're interested in attending. And uh, also one other thing is that the uh, public comment period for open uh, for complete streets is opened up uh, stayed open, I think, till February 5th, Mr. Suso. Do you think that sounds right? Do you yes, know? it does sound right. And it's Cape Cod Commission that's taken those comments, I think, right? Yes. Yes. So if people want to make any comments about complete streets, uh, if you think your street should be on the list or whatever you want to say about it, then, you know, send that along to Cape Cod Commission. Only got a few more days to do it. Great. Mr. Suso? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Town Planner Tom Bott has a... Uh, a 90 second uh, announcement if we can bring him on as a panelist. Uh, yep. One of our IT colleagues. Let's talk about the David Straits uh, reset survey. Sure. Yep. There he is. It looks like he's muted both video and audio. Here he comes. Okay. Oh, sorry. oh you're muted you're again. Muted, Tom. Okay. There you go. Sorry about that. I was being elevated and I was in the gray space. I didn't know if you had uh, announced me. Yes, I have my uh, have my timer set for 89 seconds. <laughs> um, I, uh, thank you for having me tonight, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the board. I'm Tom Bottom, the town planner here in Falmouth, Mass. And wanted to talk for a couple minutes about the Davis Straits Reset uh, program we've been putting together. Uh, the planning board's been working with uh, Union Studio and Horsley Witten on developing the form-based code uh, for the 77-acre Davis Straits area. Uh, as of the 1st of January 2021, uh, our project website is live. And if I can have a moment just to share my screen, I'll give you the briefest of tours 
of the uh, website and encourage folks to uh, take the survey if that's fine with you. Yep, go right ahead. Very well. So likely what you're seeing right now is the planning board's website. Um, so on the, uh, on the website, we have the connection down at the, here at the bottom left to the Davis Straits reset plan. Uh, you click on that and it will bring you to, uh, I got the screen right here in the way, my, <laughs> very, very frustrating. Excuse me, they, uh, my bar that says I'm sharing was right in the way of the buttons I'm pushing here. So uh, the Davis Straits Reset, uh, it's uh, officially davis.straits.com, a fairly straightforward website that our consultants put together for us. And it discusses the aspects of the project, uh, uh, the aspects of the project, including the Davis Straits. It takes you through the various studies and things that we've done and brings you to the end uh, where there's a survey. And here you can click on the survey monkey uh, survey and take the survey about what you think about the designs we put together, the uh, various elements of the plan. Uh, we will also be putting together a paper copy of the survey as well uh, in order to uh, have, uh, I'm gonna turn that off since it's uh, scrolling. So we'll also have a paper copy of the survey we'll be sending out as well for the folks who aren't uh, uh, you know, computer uh, comfortable with the computer. Uh, the comment period is open and we'll be working through the summer, uh, the winter and the spring developing the bylaw with the goal of bringing this to a town meeting uh, in November, 2021. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity and happy to take any questions. Great, any questions from the board about this? Thank you. I don't, I don't have a question about the survey, but could I ask a quick question about the, um, the roundabout in front of Davis Straits? Is the state uh, highway department still pushing for that? Uh, to be frank, I don't know. Uh, I would uh, have to check in with Peter McConnerty. Uh, I know that has been uh, the plan for phase one. Uh, the Davis Straits uh, is, uh, is you know, separate from that project. We're basically using that frontage. So whether the, the roundabout is there or not, we'll still be moving forward with uh, the hopefully the redevelopment of the area. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, thank Tom. You. Take care. Okay, returning to um, our agenda. We, um, is that it for announcements? Okay. All right. So um, now is public comment. And a reminder, this is a period of time for individuals to make a comment uh, for up to two minutes about an item that is not on our agenda this evening. Because it is not on our agenda, we cannot respond to your comment. Um, certainly, we are listening. We take in what you say. We may be able to respond in, at another meeting. But um, if anyone has a public comment at this point in time, um, I would ask them to uh, notify us in the chat. And while we're giving that just a minute, does anyone have, I didn't have any requests to read anything into public comment. Did anybody else? I did not. No. Okay. Okay. Um, so it doesn't look like we have anything. If something happens to pop up because it's taking someone a moment, um, we will uh, address that. So um, I know we have individuals who did ask to speak on particular issues and, and we'll do that. Sam? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I may have just phased out, but did you uh, go through the formalities of mentioning that we're doing this by Zoom? And I, yes, I did. Uh, sorry. I, do, I just do a real truncated version of that because it's the, that version's long. So I did, I did that in the beginning. Um, I just okay. see the one, the one note from Cheryl, but then there was no follow-up. Yeah, so if if it. she has something, obviously, if if something comes up later on, we'll we're not going to cut anyone off. We'll um, you know bring their comment in. So, yeah. okay. Next, um, what we wanted to do is obviously, I think everyone is um, really aware of the very tragic accident that happened recently on one fifty one, and that took the life of um, a four year old boy. And um, you know, is just there aren't really any you know words that I can say tonight that are going to um, you know, speak to that appropriately. But that particular event has really, um, I think, you know, mobilized the community as it absolutely should to ask once again about what's happening on 151. Um, it is an issue that we as a board and as a town have sort of talked about um, and, and 
struggled with for a long time for a number of reasons that we'll get into a bit tonight. And so while this particular accident is on a part of the highway that's controlled by the state and hasn't been one of the areas that we've studied in terms of making improvements to, just this particular tragedy um, has really, I think, um, brought the subject matter back into the public's mind to say what's going on on this road that has been um, you know, really a challenge for a long time. Um, and so what we thought we would do tonight is um, have Peter McConnerty join us um, and just talk a little bit about where any of those, you know, we've done a number of studies. We, we've talked about this. I think we probably talked about this last maybe year, year and a half ago was perhaps the last time we discussed this particular matter. So it's timely. Um, we thought we'd bring Peter in. We also, as I noted, um, if we can let in Senator Moran and our state reps, if they are with us, um, and I know that it's pretty early in the night, so they um, may not have jumped on already, but I know Sue is. We'll see if um, David and uh, Dylan are. And, um, you know, just have a conversation about where things are, what options we have, and where we go from here. So, so really, that's, um, you know, what we wanted to do. Doug Brown? I just wanted to make a mention, uh, there's a petition on uh, change.org with, uh, as I checked this evening before the meeting, there was uh, 4,700 people had signed asking us to do something about the conditions on Route 151. Yep. And so, and that really came directly out of that tragedy. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, the first step is for a lot of folks, this may be, um, you know, the first time they're going to hear about what has even happened on 151 in terms of what the town is trying to do. It may not have been on their radar. They may not have been at other meetings when we've talked about it. So we really just want to get an update and then have a discussion. Um, and, and it'll certainly be on further agendas as well. But um, Peter, if you um, are able to just kind of give us a sense and welcome Senator Moran, thank you for joining us. Um, we are you know, pleased to have you here tonight, although obviously wishing it were on you know, a different subject matter, but thank you for joining us. Um, and, you know, really the reason why we've asked our, uh, you know, legislators is because some of this discussion, frankly, almost all of it is going to involve discussions at the state level um, with Mass DOT. And we really do need that advocacy uh, when, you know, we start to move forward, we do need that communication. So uh, thank you for being here. And um, Peter, if you want to, you know, sort of walk us through where things are at and kind of where in your mind, you know, we are, we need to go next or at least, uh, you know, take a look at next. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Peter McConaughey, director of public works. Um, just to give a little history of <clears throat> route 151, route, route 151, it is a route number, um, but it is under town jurisdiction. So um, the Town has full jurisdiction to do rep to do repairs, to do um, upgrades to the roadway. But when the town, uh, back in early 2000s, when the town uh, performed some um, improvements on Route 151, they signed an agreement with Mass DOT. So although the town can do work on Route 151, any work that gets completed or gets proposed has to go through Mass DOT and they have to consent to it. So the re any work that gets proposed has to go to uh, Mass DOT District 5. They review it and then they can back, come back with their comments. Um, so it's, it's not just free for the town to do what they want to do on the roadway. Um, so, that, so that's just number one. So over the years, there's been a lot of discussions on Route 151. There's been a lot of um, reports and meetings on 151 by town personnel and state personnel. The latest report that was performed is um, we're looking at three road, uh, three intersections on 151, the intersection at Sam Turner, Boxbury Hill. And I think you've, uh, we, we came in front of the board in October, September, October of last year. And we, we put together some concept plans for that intersection. That intersection is, in my opinion, is probably the most dangerous in town. It's a very dangerous intersection. It's dark. Um, there's lot. There's not a lot of traffic control on the roadway. Um, people, it, it's a. It, you got five intersections, five roadways actually coming out into one intersection, 
And during the hunting season, there's also another driveway that, that drives into the Massachusetts wildlife area. So it's, uh, it's very busy um, and it can be confusing. So what the town had done is they, we had an R, it's called an RSA, it's a road safety audit uh, completed on this, on this intersection. So um, I had submitted this past week uh, a portion of the RSA report to the select board. Uh, and basically what happened is town officials, the town fire chief, the police chief, myself, town manager, um, the previous director of public works, the, the town planner, um, and many others, the Cape Cod Commission and Mass DOT all met on site and they, we walked through that intersection. We walked through the Sandwich Road 151 intersection and we went through the Courier Road where the flashing light intersection is there at the uh, the fairgrounds. And I think what precipitated that is the, there was a, a fatality at the Courier Road intersection approximately two years ago where the flashing light is. There was a, a Sandwich Road, there's a lot of um, T-bone accidents and head-on accidents for vehicles traveling from the highway towards Mashpee. There's, there is a left lane coming from Mash, Mashpee to go down Sandwich Road. There is not a left lane turn uh, going east towards Mashpee. So if there is trucks in front of you, where, where there, there are a lot of trucks on Route 50, 151, you cannot see around the truck. And um, a lot of people take that corner going up towards the base or going down towards the Schumann Valley area. And uh, it's just a dangerous intersection. It's a dangerous, that's a dangerous pinch point. There's two lanes. One lane is the straight lane and left lane. The right lane is for right turn only. A lot of time people go through that right turn lane and they, they go straight and um, causes accidents. So it's confusing. Although, uh, uh, Sam Turner and Boxbury Hill, Locust, uh, um, um, Boxbury Hill and 151 is the most dangerous. The one that's the intersection that's most ahead right now at this point is the Sandwich Road in 151. We're looking to just do modifications on the signal. We're not looking to redo the whole intersection. We're just looking to add a left turn lane. There's plenty of width and a portion of a sidewalk to get around the corner on the Clausen's corner side where the gas station is there to get down to the Dunkin' Donuts entrance. So if anyone wanted to come from the Schumann Valley, they could come across that intersection. They could get onto a sidewalk and it would take them safe, safely down to the gas station and down to the Dunkin' Donuts area. Um, there was also in 2017, a fatality at the uh, Cloverfield and um, uh, Sam Turner, Foxbury Hill. So that's, what sparked this RSA and to be looking at these intersections. So although there's not a full report on the entire segment of roadway, those intersections were concentrated on. And in the report, there was a lot of immediate, short-term and long-term improvements that can be done on the roadway. Um, and immediate, is would be things like brushing back the edges of the road, make sure that the edges of the road are clear. Uh, there's a lot of signage on that roadway. If you drive that, a lot of the signs are original signs, they're older signs. So you want to be, you'd want to look at the signs to make sure that they're accurate, and then you'd want to replace the signs. The new signs today have a reflectivity, re reflectivity on them that when you're driving down the street at nighttime, the, it's, the signs are prismatic, so your headlights flash off the signs and it comes back at you. So you, it's very clear and very easy to see. Um, the, the other thing we could look at is, is um, street signs, uh, um, you know, the, the road name signs, the street, the street name signs. We would, as we do work and projects throughout town, we, re, we replace all along a segment of road where we replace all the street signs. So it's very easy to see at nighttime. Route 151 is a very dark road at night. There's not a lot of street lighting on that roadway. Um, and so it makes it very difficult to read the street signs coming. A lot of those street signs are the older signs. Um, so that would be, those would be types of short term Intermediate projects or, or mid-range projects would be looking at the striping on the roadway. Um, anyone that's gone north has gone up New Hampshire, like Route 16, or gone over to the other side of the Cape down, going down towards Orleans. You see what they've done in the medium road. 
and I'm not saying putting uh, safety stanchions up in the road, but the center line of that roadway, the double yellow line, it's about a foot wide, maybe a foot and a half wide. To take a look at that roadway, and there is plenty of room with the shoulders to take a look at that to maybe widen out the center line. And then in some areas, what they've done is they've put like a, a rumble strip. They take a machine and they, they rumble up. Anyone driving up Route 3, or route, you, 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 when you go off the road a little bit, you drive over and it gets your attention. So maybe making that double the width or maybe even a little wider would separate the area between the two lanes, the east and the west lane. So, uh, and then a, uh, and, and possibility, the possibility of putting up driver feedback signs. We have a, several of them in town. And basically what it is, it's, it's a sign, a stanchion that's solar, it's solar powered, solar, solar mount, um, uh, mounted solar power, that it has a speed limit sign on it, but it also has a flash in sign that if you drive over the speed limit, it's, it flashes back at you and it has a little white strobe in the center of it to alert motorists that they're, they're over the speed limit. Um, because the, the, the roadways, it's a straight section of roadway. So people, it's a 50 mile an hour road, but I would say it's just the habits of, of motorists is they drive what they're comfortable out on a roadway. So it's a 50 mile an hour road, but many times the vehicles would be going faster. They'd be doing 60, 65 on the roadway. And when you start increasing the speeds and you look at the brake reaction time or the reaction time, if another car was pulling in front of you, it, it diminishes uh, dramatically the faster you go. The, the fourth intersection that was on, it's been on and it's been off for the, uh, for the state was the intersection of Route 28A and, one, and uh, 151. And I think that was in front of the board I, I, a number of times. I think it was at least three times in front of the board. Yeah. Um, back and forth, uh, and that was back in 2016, 2017. And even since then, um, going to the joint transportation meetings at the Cape Cod Commission, the state has uh, put it back on the list, they've taken it off the list, they've put it back on the list. And I think right now at this time, I think that intersection is off the list. But that was triggered, the intersection was tr triggered because the Federal Highway Administration looks at intersections uh, crash rates and when you get to a certain number of crash rates on an intersection per year that creates an automatic um, um, research and an automatic uh, review of that intersection by the by DOT. So at this time we have those four intersections uh, they're in play they're in conceptual design uh, like I say the the, the uh, sandwich road is first that's probably going to go first the Sam Turner would be second um, and then the Route uh, 151 28A would be under the state. So the, there are some immediate things that can be done out there, but uh, I, I think for the for the for the the the, um, the midway or the long term, the mid the, the uh, midterm or the long term would be more the the goal of looking at the roadway and looking at the design of the roadway. So th thank you, Peter. So. Can you just, um, and, and you're alluding to this, but just for the folks that are watching. So, you know, say um, for instance, that Courier Road intersection, right? I mean, you're, you're putting your finger on it when you talk about how fast people drive on 151. And so even if you have the rumble strips and all of that, if someone, you know, that Courier Road, it's someone's going 60 or 55 and the person thinks they can make it through the intersection. And, and we've had so many accidents there for that exact reason. Um, what, what, just so that the public can understand, if, if tomorrow we decided, okay, that should just be a four-way stop, right? Where, you know, when the people are on Courier Road, it's a sensor and it becomes a four-way stop. What is the process? I mean, we just can't go ahead and do that, correct? We have to run that through DOT? Uh, yeah, DOT would have to look that, uh, would have to review that. So, um, four-way stops, uh, I, I know a lot of um, folks look at four-way stops as being a way to, for speed control, but actually what it does, it, that's a heavily traveled roadway um, and stopping the mainstream of traffic could, will create, it could create backups and, and other repercussions down the road. So a four-way stop at that location, um, I think would want to look at that further. I think would be 
wanting to look at do something different at that intersection. Uh, it's got a flashing the flashing light there right now. It's an older light. I mean, yeah, you can see that coming up the roadway, but it it's not very effective with 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 what it does. So um, the funds that we have available right now, what you want to do is you want to go through these intersections. You want to get the design done. Once the design is done and it's shovel ready, then you take them to the Cape Cod Commission or you take them to the state on the state, um, the, the uh, transportation bond bill. And um, you have a better chance when it's shovel ready to get a project up, up and going. Mm -hmm. But in an intersection like that, we would want to bring in our traffic consultants and they would, they would take a look at that to, to be able to give us some recommendations of, of uh, all, actually all four of those intersections. And, and, and so, like three of them, three of them are already that we already have, know what we want to do with them with the concepts. We just have to move into the pub, the uh, public hearings and move towards twenty five percent. Okay. And when would when do you anticipate so that the public can just have it on their radar that that portion that you're talking about, kind of do, moving into the public hearings and getting to that place where I get what you're saying. You want to be ready to be able to get on the tip, to get some funds, you know, things like that, to be able to move forward. When would that next piece of that public hearing, um, you know, just sort of in a ballpark, when do you think that that would be ready for, for that to take place? So, so right now at this time, because we're not doing too many uh, improvements to the 151 Sandwich Road, that project's pretty well ready to go. That's at 90% right now. There's not really a lot of public design on that. We were just adding a left turn lane. We were going to add a couple of more traffic into um, the overhead traffic intersections above um, some new some new mass downs. The uh, Sam Turner and uh, Locustfield that uh, and um, Cloverfield that is in conceptual. That's we're moving forward towards a public design on that right now. A public hearing on that right now where uh, we would bring in, probably at this point, it would be a Zoom meeting. It wouldn't be an actual uh, meeting. We bring in our consultant, uh, consultants, us at Public Works, town officials, and would bring in um, the uh, transportation consultant with the designs. So we already looked at a, a roundabout and we looked at a, a traffic intersection and, and mm -hmm. the traffic intersection, a signalized intersection, because it's a wide area, when you're, you're including all those roads coming out into that into 151, the intra signalized intersection was the best um, was the best option for that. So we're mm -hmm. looking to move forward with that. We have the design funds on that ready to go. Um, the Courier Road at uh, the fairgrounds, we did the RSA, we completed the report. The design has not been started on on uh, that project right now, so we would need to get some design funding to to, to, uh, to move that forward. And and we can check for for 151 and 28A. We can check with the state to see to see where they are on that. They, they, they've been that that's been on and off for at least four times. So we would have to yeah. check with that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Doug Brown. And, and then any other questions from uh, anyone else or any comments? So go ahead, Doug. Just wanted to comment that I uh, sent messages to both uh, Dave Vieira and Dylan Fernandez, and both apologize for not being able to make it, but they're willing to uh, support us if we decide to vote and request something. So, okay, great, thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Peter or any comments? Uh, uh, Patterson, go ahead. Yeah, Peter, uh, how do we make sure that there's not a grant available through the state chapter nine or something like that? Uh, we don't want to miss. Uh, is that pretty transparent? Yeah, they're transparent. Usually the grants for those, we, we can check them, Sam. Usually the grants for those are for construction dollars. Uh, they like to see the design to be completed. Um, but that's something that's something we can take a look at, you know. So the 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 thought process that I was looking at was for the intersection of, say the intersection of, of Sam Turner and Boxberry Hill. So it, it's a town roadway. The state has to do their consent on it. But if we went to the Cape Cod Commission on that for design dollars, we'd be getting in line and we'd be at year 26 or 27. So the thought on that would be to uh, the possibility of maybe doing that uh, under a town meeting article to see if that could be done under a town meeting article. It could be done faster because if not, would be put at the end of the line at the, it would be put at the end of their five-year plan. 
Yep, Doug Brown. So Peter, when I was looking at the report that you sent, I didn't get to read the whole thing, but I did notice that um, the elevations were noted in there as a concern. You know, the, a lot of dips in the road and high points. I'd love to see a long range plan to, to start to address that because I feel like that's another big part of the safety concern on that road. Some of the, yes. some of the I was just gonna say some of the head on accidents happen in those, those stretches. Correct. Yeah. So I think that so for a long term design on Route 151, that would be something we would want to we want to look at. Basically, the roadway follows the contour of the land out there. Um, but we would be want to be, and I'm sure when it was first built, they used those low points for the drainage areas to get the water off the roadway. But mm -hmm. some of those vertical curves, the the sag curves, they they dip they up. And it's hard to see when you're coming over a crest of another. Uh, from another road just to come down and see that you can't see them coming up on the other side. And I have another question about the design process. Does most of this design work happen in house with with your staff? No, no. For for a uh, for, for projects like this, this is it's a high speed roadway. It's a four, it's a fifty mile an hour roadway. So something like this, we would go out to our consultant. Um, our we can we do small work we can do some small intersection work transportation work but when you're looking at a roadway segment segment are that many vehicles per day going through the intersection that's something we we send out to because you, you need to have a full survey you need and then they have to look at but with the state they just can't come out you just can't come out and say we're going to put in a roundabout or an intersection they have to do an alternatives analysis and look at what's best for the for the intersection or what have you um so so um how do we get this project on 151 rolling. Is there uh, funds that are needed for design that we should be thinking of appropriating? Or? Well, I think if we were going to do a long term along the segment, and I think that's what we're looking at. I mean, what I was speaking of is was just the, just the intersections. Um, it would have to get some funds available to do for, to, to look at a, um, a design on that whole roadway. Um, you know, back in 2017, I, I remember having conversations with the director of public works at that time of uh, doing some uplifting, maybe looking mm -hmm. at a few, some more street lights, um, yep. changing the street signs around, um, you, you know, looking at more re reflectivity at nighttime on the roadway. Um, and that's, in the meantime, we can be doing that even if we do go get some funds for that roadway. Um, maybe the possibility of putting a couple of those driver feedback signs up. They, yeah, that, that seems like a good interim step because it does, you know, you can reduce the speed and you can let people know that they're exceeding it. Um, I think that would actually help until we get further authorization. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Nancy and then um, uh, Susan, and then I know we have a couple of people who wanted to, to chat in, so. Uh, you're, you're, you're muted, Nancy. I am. Is there any we reason why we can't move ahead with lighting, Peter? Because it is such a dark road. Um, yeah, we could look at uh, at lighting on the 151. Does not have a lot of driveways on it. It has a few businesses on it, but not a lot. So there's not a lot of turning traffic uh, in and out of that that roadway. And where where those businesses are and where those driveways are is basically where the lights are con um, concentrated. They have one at Ranch Road. They have one at the uh, um, uh, Sam Turner and Boxbury. But I, I think you'd be looking at putting a, a, a few more on on the poles that are on that roadway. And they would be a little different than the ones in Falmouth. The ones in Falmouth, the, the arms that we have, they just stick over into one lane. They, they stick out like six feet. The ones on the uh, arms on 151, they stick out about 12 feet. So they almost go towards the center of the roadway. So they're trying to light up both sides of the road. So you wouldn't have to put as many street lights in. You know, you could put several street lights in would would probably make a difference in there at nighttime. It, it's a dark road on a night very like the rain. Yeah, very there. dark and dangerous. Yeah. I see a question in the chat that relates to what we uh, discussed earlier about um, Megan Stimson says, have center barriers been considered? Seems like a quick solution that might help. I know we briefly talked about that, but what would be the, the reason for not thinking of using those, Peter? The center barriers? Yeah, those little. Um, oh, the stands. 
even if it's just those reflective things to create that space. Right, right. Well, so um, I know over on the Route 6 side, uh, basically going down towards Orleans, and Mass DOT has those stanchions, and also up at Route 3 going down towards, um, uh, when you go exit 4 and you start going off down towards, um, not Mattapoisett, um, what are the other islands down off of of, uh, of Plymouth that they have um, they they have them over there? And what happens is they they get damaged. The vehicles take them out and they knock them over. So you, you're constantly replacing them. Um, mm. um, so it, it's just it's it's more of a uh, it's a maintenance issue uh, right. with doing this. Uh, it's not something that I mean it's not, it is something that can be done. They're not very good looking. They don't look good, but it is something that that could be there. But maybe even something as even a, a wider median strip with a rumble strip in the middle of it. Um, they do it up in route 16, New Hampshire, they do it in other areas. And that sounds like a good idea. Those things really get your attention when you start to ride over those. I mean, if it's but possible to do maybe a two or three foot wide center area. But yeah. Peter, can you just clarify, I know you don't have all the data in front of you, but when I last looked at the data, it, the real troublesome part of 151 are those intersections that we've just talked about. When you really start to look at the number, not that we don't do these other items as well, I think all of that helps, um, maybe helps slow people down, makes them pay attention. You know, if they hit a rumble strip, they're paying attention if they see the flashing lights. Um, but um, my understanding is that most of those accidents are, are really where, where this, the roads kind of converge into 151. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of why we had started, the town had started even a while ago, looking at those different remedies for those intersections. But um, it sounds like these other things that you've talked about tonight would also be really helpful to do in the interim, you know, just to get people's attention and slow them down um, on that, um, you know, on that strip, so. Yeah, so so something like the uh, the feedback signs, that's not, I, I think something like that, we could just notify DOT. They don't have to do a big review of it. There's not plans or anything. Um, something with replacing the signage and something with replacing the street signs. That would not have to go through DOT. And putting up more street lights, we could notify them, but I don't think that would have a problem with. Uh, with. So the report that I sent you, that was actually the front end of the report. And I think there was only, there might have been 30 pages to that. That's a, I think I sent you the main report last week that the main report is 241 pages. So all those additional pages is all uh, crash data and crash accidents and, and how the crashes happened, when they took place and how they happened. So there's a lot of information that, in that report about. Yep. Um, yeah. So we got a comment from uh, Mike Halen on the chat and his question yeah. is- Yeah, Doug, I'm gonna- if you just want to hold on a second, I'm going to have okay. Sue talk and then I'll actually let okay, sorry. Mike, I'll just ask for IT to let Mike come in because I just don't like, um, you know, we just start to have so much in the chat and I'd rather just have the person be able to come on, make their comment and, and then Peter, it just is more efficient. So Sue, go okay. ahead and then IT, if we can have um, Mike Halen come on in and he, he has a couple of questions, I think, to ask of us and of Peter. So thanks, sure. Sue, for being here. Um, Megan, thanks, and, and thanks to everyone. I wanted to be here to represent the delegation uh, at the very beginning on what, the actions that the town is starting to take tonight in response to the very tragic accident. Uh, the loss of a child is the worst thing uh, for parents and, and for the community. The um, part, part of what I do as your senator is to be a member of the Joint uh, Committee on Transportation. And going forward, I'm, I'm here just really as a resource. Um, uh, Public Works uh, Director Peter McConaughey obviously has this all in hand. The town is uh, well known in the state for being shovel ready and for getting uh, things done. And really, you know, there's a lot of competition for resources and and for approvals and to get um, projects moving. And Falmouth tends to do a good job of getting all of that ready and, and therefore moving those projects. And so uh, Mr. McConaughey and, and Mr. Suso and the, the administrators and selectmen um, can move through the state process um, very agilely. 
Uh, but I'm just here to, as well as uh, Rep uh, Fernandez and Vieira to lend our support in terms of anything that we can move ahead, any resources that you may need. Um, and uh, again, I'll, I'll be here just to hear the, where you're at with the, um, your thoughts tonight and we'll continue the follow up after this. Great. Thank you, Sue. And we know that it's, um, you know, it really is important sometimes to have the those extra advocates, you know, on Beacon Hill. There are tens of thousands of projects throughout the Commonwealth. All of them are worthy and all of them are seeking funds. Um, and so to have, you know, folks there just, you know, talking to the right individuals to remind them about, um, you know, just exactly those things that we're ready, we can execute, we can get these things done. That's really helpful. So thank you. Um, if we could have Mike Halen come in and also Jane Perry is on the phone line and had asked to make a brief comment. She had called me um, yesterday. She can't come in via Zoom. So um, we will open that up after. So go ahead, Mike. Hello, uh, Chair Braga. Thank you very much for your emails and let me speak briefly. Um, the accident that happened last week and I, um, I just want to send my thoughts and prayers to Akimos' family. It's a horrible thing, but um, it, this wasn't my idea. Uh, another mother in town reached out to me to see what we could do. So um, I took the reins and I started researching, and I found that 2018 um, Cape Commission report. And everything that Peter said, I like Peter, I think he's doing a good job. Everything he said, I agree with. Um, and I. I know that the state has, you know, you got to work with the state, all that stuff, but the smaller stuff like the stop lines, you know, left turn only signs, um, even like the, the flashing speed limit signs, those are things that on, on town property that we can do like as soon as possible. Um, I, I don't, I'm, that's a question for you, Peter. And uh, like what Megan said earlier about the, um, the yellow dealies that they have on route six uh, or the rumble strips would work. Um, but I know that's a, like a longer term thing. I just think that um, I want to thank you all for having me. And I just think that if we can get those stop signs up and the flashers, you know, paint the stuff, um, that would be a start. And then, you know, hopefully the state can come in. We all can work together, you know, just get all this malarkey out of the way and move forward. But thank you all for having me. And, um, you know, Peter, if you, if you need anything else from, from me, I'd be more than happy to help out or connect with some people that live on those side streets that might have a better understanding than I do. But thank you all very much. And I'm going to let you go at that. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, yeah. Thanks Mike. So, so, Peter, I think, and I'm just going to go back, you know, I think he was, Mike was highlighting some of the things that we had talked about. So some of those lights, it sounds like we can do that with maybe just notifying DOT that we're going to do it in terms of those speed flashers it sounds like that's something that we have a little bit more um ability to kind of effectuate yeah that's something we can do with with that is it's it's a funding issue uh with putting those up so say you put two or three of them uh go in each direction so we just have to look at the funding the ones that were put up uh, in other areas of town they range at about 12 to fourteen thousand a piece so with this just something we'd want to we'd have to uh look at with the funding Yep, and just be strategic about how they're how they're used. Yep. Yeah, and, and I think if you know if you put several of them, uh, if if you put two each direction, three each direction at certain areas, I I think it would work out well. And and the 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 signs, the um, and even the striping, we do the striping. Typically, they put a four inch uh, edge line. They put a four inch yellow center line. Maybe make it up. Maybe make that center line wider and make it a wider um, goal line. Um, and maybe our midterm, a midterm solution is to uh, use a type of rumble strip, maybe type thing. So with, with those um, with those stanchions, the uh, reflective stanchions, it's just we'd have to be careful about the driveways. Uh, there's several driveways up there. Uh, a number of driveways we just have to look at so that we're not when if vehicles are crossing, we wouldn't be blocking. You know. Yep. To get but you know, I maybe a suggestion is to have several people. You know, Public Works made the town planner take a look at that and uh, say these are the solutions. This, this is what we'd like to do. I mean, we could get a, a tree crews up there to do some um, cutting back. I, I don't think it needs a lot of brush back, but I think there are some areas that we could get some brush back on. Um, and 
one thing that really aggravates me coming up nighttime is, uh, and I'm the director of public works, but <laughs> um, coming nighttime going uh, eastbound, if you, when you're coming up to that uh, uh, Cloverfield intersection, you're looking at a yellow light flashing at you and you're looking at a red light flashing at you at the same time. It's very confusing if you were not used to that yeah. intersection coming up on it. So they have, they do have heads that you can buy on that to a longer head. So you don't see the different colors um, when you're coming up, coming down 150. Yep. So it could be something like that too. Great. Thank you, Peter. Sam, did you have another comment? Just a question. I mean, I, I know we had the one incident uh, when there was a head on, somebody crossed over in front of a oncoming uh, truck in this case. Uh, but how many uh, head on type collisions do we have there? Um, I mean, I, I'm just asking, I'm, I'm trying to think through the process. Uh, this, the idea of, of delineating the center of the lanes, I don't see the benefit of doing that. Uh, it seems more like we, we need to get people slowed down and we got to make them more aware of the fact that there is an intersection and obviously people are going to be crossing or turning. So, and, and, and another item is maybe um, um, we could talk with the chief. The chief, I, he might have a couple of those speed trailers just in the interim to get that out there while we're looking at some different options. They can, I mean, I don't want, I know these very busy. I don't want to give them more work, but they can put them in a couple of different places over the next few weeks to get, just to get people notified that there's it, the speed, you know. Great. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I want to thank everyone. I see that Jane has joined us. So Jane, we're, um, if you have a, you know, kind of brief comment um, or question for anyone, welcome. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. For the record, my name is Jane F. Perry, and I live on Galleon Drive. And tonight I am speaking as not as a transportation advocate or an advocate for the disabled or the visually impaired, but as a 30-year resident who lives in this neighborhood. I thank you for having this meeting. Peter and I have spoken on this issue a very long time, and it's, and it's from food for thought as we go forward. Yes, this was a state highway, but in 1997, it was swapped for Woodtow Road when they were going to do paving. And the state is the interchanges that go from the ramp up to the interchanges going to Route 28 North and 28 South, where this accident happened. So he has touched on some ideas, but I have some ideas that I'd like to expand on and put on the record, if I may. One sure. is signage, speed limit sign, dangerous intersection ahead on both sides of the road. Also, if you turn left into Boxville Hill Road or Sam Turner Road from 151, there is a huge pothole there. And when it rains, it fills it in. And someone could have a serious axle injury to their car and to themselves. Now, let's talk about the intersection. Roundabout will not work there. Roundabouts do not work. I don't care what anybody says. They do not work for bicycles, pedestrians, visually impaired. And as far as moving vehicles, you might go around there three times before you know which leg of the roundabout to get off of. A signalized intersection has been there. And Newton on Center Street, the Carroll Center for the Blind teaches people who are visually impaired to, to cross a five-way intersection. And it isn't doable. Also, splitter islands, which is a tool for the complete streets, do not work, even though it's a tool. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing is, along with the signage, we need to have this, and I will make my other comments known to Mr. Tupper and to Ms. Medeiros this week, because I was at the complete streets hearing, <clears throat> excuse me, that we need a signalized intersection there, desperately, because people think that that's Falmouth Indy 500 Speedway. They go too fast on there, and there's too many accidents. I wish I had known that you had the safety audit. I would have been there for someone representing the lay people and the public and the neighbors of my neighborhood because we need to have more outreach for the public. We need to, um, as far as complete streets, it needs to be on the priority list at the top. I know the Bikeway Pedestrian Committee has, has asked on their bike plan that's in the Cape Cod Commission to put a sidewalk from the end of 151 up to Mashpee so that people can go down the side streets and connect another way to connect to the east-west quarter of our town. I would think a sidewalk or a um, bike lane should be put there. 
I like the rumble strips idea. The other thing too is um, with complete streets, you need to, um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. But anyway, um, I guess I'll have to say, um, I, I realize that there have been several accidents that people don't know about. On 151, it's very ill lit, well on lit, excuse me. My neighbor who lives two stores down from me, their son, uh, Chalifos boy, was Killed. died on that road. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've had other people that I know have died on that road. And we need to look at this. We need to get it on the complete streets. We need a no flashing lights, no beacon lights. We need a real, real pedestrian, I mean, intersection. And if the consultant that has been hired to look at this work is the same one that did the work on Davis Straits and Davis the Road. Is it, Peter? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. They are wonderful because I work with them, as Mr. McConney will tell you, intensively. Now, those two intersections are almost 100% compliant. You have to be compliant not only with the legal aspects and all the books and manuals that Peter and the state deal with, but in real time. So it works so that people can travel safely from our neighborhood onto 151. 151 is a connector road from Mashby to, to Falmouth to Bourne. And also, there is a Cape Cod RTA fixed route bus that runs Monday through Friday on that road. I don't know how much it's running now with the pandemic, but it is there, as Mr. Tim Patterson will tell you, it is there as our representative of the RTA. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you, you for listening to me. I appreciate you um, letting me have my reasonable accommodation. And I hope Peter will um, check in with me from time to time. I am no longer on the Transportation Management Committee. I believe you got my resignation today. And therefore, but I will still always be involved in transportation. So thank you for your time. And I really, truly hope that we have more outreach. We don't have a village association in Hatchville. Maybe it's time to do one. But Come travel with us and you'll see the problems. Thank also, you, Jane. Oh, four way stop sign does not work. You can ask the Trans Traffic Advisory Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, very much. And I'm glad you're able to join us via phone. I'm glad that that worked out. Um, and certainly, um, you know, as Peter notes, we're, we're not at the end of this, but there are some short term, me medium term, and then long term responses we can take. So thank you to everyone, um, you know, who weighed in and, um, for folks, it looks like um, Megan Stimson is gonna send us some other um, comments. So we really appreciate it. Um, and um, for the public, you know, this is a long stretch of road. It, it's a road that uh, for those of us who live in Hatchville or, or North Falmouth, I mean, you know, we're on it every day. So please send us your thoughts, send us your concerns and we'll get those to the DPW and the folks that need to see it. So Peter, thank you very much. Really appreciate um, you just kind of updating us on what's happening and we'll look forward to hearing, um, you know, more about uh, when those steps are taking place and, and those changes are happening. Please let us know. Great, we thank you. Should we forward comments, email comments to you, Peter? Uh, yeah, they can be forwarded to me. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll gather them. Like I say, what, what I'll probably do is meet with the town planner and we'll go through this. I, I, I don't want to do this in a box. I want to do it with, uh, with others in town that we, you know, so everyone's on board. We got a pretty long detailed um, email from Joe Voci today with pretty good suggestions. So I'll forward yeah. that. And if we get others, I'll copy the town managers and, and copy to you. Great. Great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Next, uh, next, uh, I just want to get started with our public hearings. We are definitely behind. Um, and thank you for all those folks for your patience. We, you know, we're covering a pretty important issue there. So I appreciate <laughs> folks being patient. Our first hearing tonight, excuse me, is application for transfer of a wine and malt <clears throat> package store license, MA Friends Incorporated. DBA Jack and the Beanstalk, 800 Gifford Street Extension, Falmouth, continued from 1, <clears throat> excuse me, 1121. So welcome, I see Attorney Lebhertz. <clears throat> this is an extension, uh, continuance of a hearing that took place. I wasn't there for that meeting. Um, I was home with um, my daughter who wasn't well. And so uh, Chairman Brown ran that meeting um, and we are back here today to address some other issues. Um, let me just quickly read the 
hearing notice, notices hereby given under chapter 138 of the general laws as amended that MA Friends Inc. DBA Jack and the Beanstalk has applied for a transfer of a wine and malt package store license located at 800 Gifford Street extension Falmouth, Mass. A hearing will be held in the Selectman's meeting room, Falmouth Town Hall on Monday, January 11th, 2021 at 730 on the above application. Um, and this was published Friday, December 25th, and then we are continued here to tonight. So welcome, Attorney Lev Hertz. Good evening. So this was, um, we, were, we were provided some updated materials um, from Attorney Lev Hertz, both on the 27th and the 28th of January. Um, also, there are some other, some other emails just um, from town council, Irie Mullen, um, addressing some questions I think that the board had had about where this process stands. Um, and so my understanding tonight is that it's the job of this board to make a determination um, about whether or not there is sort of enough um, of a distinction between uh, the, the two entities that we had, that you guys had talked about and, and I think had some robust discussion about at your last um, hearing. So Attorney Lepertz, if you just want to, um, you know, sort of walk us through, um, you know, the, the letter that you sent to just point out how you see that distinction being um, in conformity with the statute. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I would preface my comments by saying I, I do see Sarav Patel uh, on the Zoom. I don't. I assume you can see him as well. We yes. can. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if the IT person could bring in Attorney Alan Costa if he is uh, on the Zoom. He, and he is. I see him in the in the attendees. So <clears throat> okay, I, I don't see him. I suspect uh, the. Uh, owner of the attorney for the owner of the property as well. Uh, Mr. Burke, his attorney, Mr. Sinitas is may very well be on the, on the, uh, there's attorney Costa. So I've let seen, me I've just see attorney Costa. Oh. Okay. It's been a while since I've seen attorney Costa. Um, well, in any event, I've had a lot of uh, conversations with Alan and uh, this, this, these past couple of weeks. Yes, we were before the board uh, some weeks back. And um, <clears throat> it was brought to my attention um, uh, for the second time, uh, I, but, but far more explicitly uh, that the second time that there was some concerns um, about um, certain individuals having an interest in another license that may arguably have an interest in this license as well. Um, and uh, when, I when that was brought to my attention, I, I did uh, obtain a copy of uh, Attorney Mullen's uh, memorandum, and I reviewed it and went over it with um, all of the uh, personnel that are involved in this application. And I, I think we came up with a, uh, a common sense solution. Just in terms of how, uh, what everybody's involvement is here, um, this is essentially a, a proposed sale of the, the premises known as Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, a real estate sale and a separate business sale. Um, <clears throat> Attorney Costa has been uh, representing your purchasers of the property. And I uh, was asked to uh, become involved um, merely in the license transfer. And my main contact has been Aku or Sarav Patel, who's on the on the screen. And um, <clears throat> I was introduced to the other individuals as well. Uh, but it's been very, very clear to me that the, the person who's uh, going to be managing this property and the person that's going to have uh, probably the greatest degree of, of control over the property is going to be Mr. Patel. But uh, when, it, when I read Mullen's uh, concerns were raised, uh, I did uh, reach out to Mr. Costa and um, he did prepare a, uh, a memorandum and some amendments to some paperwork, which I incorporated into a letter uh, to the board dated January 27th. 
And uh, I had it hand delivered. I had it emailed. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we got it into the record well, well in advance. Um, <clears throat> so essentially, um, if I could uh, alleviate the board's concerns, or perhaps Mr. Costa may also be able to, here's really the situation. There, there, there is a, a, another license in town that is owned by uh, a, a, a corporation called MZ, uh, I believe it's MZ Enterprises. And there are two principals uh, of MZ, an individual named uh, Rashid Zahid and an individual named Mingma Sherpa. And um, <clears throat> those two individuals are involved in this transaction in a, in a different or limited capacity. They are the proposed purchasers of the real estate. Uh, they have formed an LLC called MNA LLC. And while the original purchase and sale agreement was in the name of MZ, it has been assigned to MNA. So you do have, I don't consider it a uh, conflictual or, or a strong link, but you have two individuals through a, an LLC that are proposing to purchase this real estate. And yes, those individuals do hold an interest in a, in a license at another location, but they do not, we are not proposing, nor have we ever proposed that they would have an interest in the license that's before this board. <clears throat> when I first became involved, uh, Mr. Patel made it very clear to me that it was MA Friends. And we were able to uh, go online and we were able to establish that MA Friends uh, does exist and that the principles behind MA Friends are uh, Mr. Patel and a, a, an, indiv an individual named Doma Sherpa. And I don't know whether she is on the... Uh, on the Zoom as well tonight or not. I, I can only see a certain number of us here. Um, but uh, she's certainly well known to Mr. Costa and uh, Mr. Costa is very well uh, known to she, her husband and some other individuals that are loosely connected here. But the point is that Doma Sherpa, neither Doma Sherpa nor Mr. Patel hold any interest in MZ Enterprises, which holds another license. So um, although uh, I, I can certainly understand um, Ms. Mullen you know, bringing a, a, uh, uh, this relationship to the board's attention, uh, I know that there, uh, there, there are attorneys in the, in the group here tonight, and I know that, um, and, and I know that there are some um, very experienced um, uh, people making decisions here. There, there is no prohibition whatsoever between, um, uh, 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 b because there is one spouse that holds an interest in one license and a different spouse may hold an interest in a different license. In fact, we went through a great deal of um, tri trials and tribulations in the law to make it very clear that husbands and wives can even enter into contracts with each other. They are separate people. Uh, and, 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 and we're all the better for it. They, they, people can, can hold separate interests. And because a husband ho holds an interest in a license, that doesn't connect a wife to it in any way, shape, or form. And the vice versa. A wife can hold an interest in a license. And that does not connect the husband to it in any way, shape, or form. I might further add, these are, the actual license holder would be a, a, a separate um, uh, company, MA Friends, uh, which, you know, is not an individual. We propose the manager to be Mr. Patel for, for the obvious reason. He is, is, is eminently qualified. He is the person who's gonna be on this site um, morning, noon, and night, uh, as, as I'm sure you're familiar with him at his other location uh, over on, on Main Street. He, he's your, your, your person that's going to be uh, the hands-on, most responsible um, individual. 
So let so, me just, uh, Attorney Leverance, let me just ask first, um, because I think you've outlined it you know, really well, both in what was sent to us in advance and then how you've sort of articulated and gone through it tonight. Let me start by asking the board and we can direct it to either Attorney Levhertz or Attorney Costa. Um, does this board have any questions about what we've just heard, what we've had in advance in terms of how these, um, this is proposed to be held? Go ahead, I see Mr. Jones and then Mr. Patterson. The two quick questions I have, I do understand that Mr. Patel will be the manager, even though he is the minority owner of this business. Is that correct, Mr. Lebert? That That is correct. He, he He's a one, you know, it, it was an investment, you know, uh, uh, an issue about money. Okay. Uh, he, he is going to be the one third owner of the business, but he is going to be the 100% manager of the business. Okay, that's the second question. You said that he's been doing this someplace else? Not, 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 not with a, a, an alcoholic license. Uh, Mr. Uh, Patel uh, is the proprietor at the Seven uh, Eleven over on Main Street, and uh, well known in the community. Mr. Jones, is he going to still be working there? Well, he, he indicates to me. I let him. I let him speak up in terms of uh, of more specifics. But he, he indicates to me that he'll be spending the the vast majority of his time over at the uh, Jack and the Beanstalk location. Aku, would you care to speak up on that? You did mention sure. 100%. I just want to be clear whether it really is 100% or 50%. Well, well the thing he, is... Maybe he could speak up. Great. Okay. Uh, my brother-in-law who lives in Jersey is planning to come up here if the business deal goes through. So I can even hire a manager to run no. the 7-Eleven. Okay. But, but I do have family that actually can help me run that place. Okay, as long as the 7-Eleven, because the thing, the key thing we do ask that you understand is, as the manager of the liquor license, you are the one that we're going to hold responsible. And we are you to be there most of the time. Um, and I'm just, we've had, we have six different liquor licenses, so I am trying to keep details straight. Uh, you are living in Falmouth, is that right? That's right. All right, so getting over to that, to Jack and the Beanstalk, anytime there's need is not a problem. Not a problem at all. Great. Those are my two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Doug. You. Sam? Yeah, the question I have is, uh, what is the intent of MGLC 138S15? Uh, I'm a little confused about what they were trying to regulate. Uh, because, I, you know, you can say that there's, this, there's no interest between the various parties and their ownership. <clears throat> but, you know, um, Irie makes the point that having an indirect interest in multiple license applies also. So what is the intent of that Massachusetts regulation? The intent, well, I, may I offer an legal opinion if that's what's being asked? Sure, and I know- uh, well, Sure, Irene, the intent is to Irene's avoid- is to, Certainly the intent is to prohibit a person from holding two licenses. Uh, I, I, again, uh, I, I, I have no qualm with Ms. Mullen raising the issue and, and uh, you know, raising the issue doesn't make it a conflict. It makes it an, an, a, an issue worth discussing. Uh, but but a, a man owns a business or a license. Does that mean his wife does as well when it's in the man's name? No, no it doesn't. Or, or vice versa. One might say, well, they're married, you know, there's, there's a connection between the two people. How could I possibly deny that there's not a connection between two people that are married? I, I, <laughs> however, that, that's, where it, that's where it ends. There, there, there's absolutely no other connection between the two uh, with, with respect to this license. I, I, the, the, this proposed license will have absolutely no interest in, in, in Mingma Sherpa or Zahid Rashid. Uh, they're, they're not on the company that is applying. They're not on the lease. They're, 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 they're merely trying to invest in real estate and not the business. So I yes, I, I, think it's a fair, I, I think it's a very fair question for uh, Ms. Mullen to raise. And I, I hope we're able to address it to your satisfaction. I think the, re the reasoning for the legislation is to prevent one business from supplying alcohol to the other business, to somehow mix up the two licenses so that if they buy alcohol, they, we know that alcohol is going to that business not being transferred to some other store. Oh. I, I'm not familiar. 
I'm not familiar with the MZ operation where they hold the other license. Bear in mind what we're dealing with over here on, on Gifford Street. This is, this is mainly a market. This is, you know, very, very- With, be, with some beer and there. wine. Yeah, with yeah, beer. I mean, I, I, I don't know anybody that goes there just, you know, you know just to buy alcohol. You're, you're typically there and it's like a, a supermarket where they, you can get beer and wine, but uh, that certainly isn't the, the primary um, uh, sales pitch that they make over there at, uh, at Jack and the Beanstalk. They, they sell meat and they sell vegetables and they sell groceries. Um, attorney, so, attorney oh, hold on one second. Yep, one second. I just want to allow Attorney Costa. Did you um, want to weigh in on any of any of the comments that you've heard? Uh, Madam Chairwoman, thank you very much. I think the board seems to have a very good sense of it. I think I would just emphasize that we have two different principals that are going to own and operate the business, two different principals that own and operate the real estate. And as we see it, uh, we don't believe it's a violation of the statute. I, I think Chris did a great job of delineating that. I also have my letter, which I know the board had in advance, which, which I hope uh, addressed the concerns as well. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Uh, Doug Brown, you are muted. I just was uh, mentioning Mr. Patel had his hand up there. Yep, go, go ahead. Um, the thing I want to tell you guys is the alcohol business for Jack and the Beanstalks is mere 5% of the entire business. Yeah. Literally 5% or less. I mean, I went, uh, I sat down with Bobby and I looked at the numbers and alcohol is not as important than everything else in the business. Great. Thank you. Um, what I'll do now is... Oh, um, just, go ahead, Doug Brown. I just okay, you can go ahead, and then I just want to make an announcement for the public if they're watching. If there are any individuals who want to speak in favor of this license or in opposition, please um, you know notify us in the next couple of minutes so we can add you in. So go ahead, Doug Brown. Are there any other financial interests uh, related to this that we should be aware of to consider? I mean, is it, <laughs> does the liquor license? Uh, it's a leased agreement from the. The, the people that are holding the liquor license and, and running the restaurant and uh, running the business is a monthly lease to the, to the property owner. Is that how it's set up? Well, if I may, Mr. Brown, uh, yes, correct. There will be a lease agreement between the corporation MA friends, which, which will own and operate the business and MNA realty LLC, which is the landlord. There will be a lease agreement. The lease agreement will not be tied into any sales or any anything like that. It will be a set amount, uh, which is still under negotiation, but there will be uh, just a straight lease. Okay. And I asked uh, our town council for advice on exactly what the Mass General Law was. And another part of it is to avoid price fixing. So I'm just going to ask if all parties will commit to non-disclosure between family members and other associates of pricing and plans for pricing? Because I think that's, if I get your personal commitment that that's a, something that you think you can manage, then I think I can support this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't see why not, Mr. Brown. Okay, great. Um, let me just see if I, I don't see anything in public comment. Um, so what is the pleasure of this board? I move we close the hearing. Okay, I have a motion Pat to close Patterson the hearing. Second. Patterson, Patterson second. second. Okay, all those in favor of closing the hearing by roll call, please. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. Okay, so we've closed the hearing. Um, and I'll take any um, motion or conversation from this board. I would move we approve, uh, that we approve the transfer of, license, of the liquor license. Okay, I have a motion Pat to approve. Patterson, second. I have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, please. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Jones? Uh, Jones, I guess just to clarify, that's a wine and malt package store license. Thank you. Um, English Braga, aye. Great, Th thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, you coming Thank back you. to clarifying. Thank you. Good Thank luck. You, Thank you.
Okay, next we have, sorry, I'm just pulling up. Okay. Next we have another hearing, um, application for transfer of an all alcoholic beverage in holder license Seacrest Concessionaire LLC located at three. We have the wetland dock hearing, it's number two. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Through. It's going to be delayed, Excuse continued me. anyway, but. All right. Yeah, yeah, so the wetland dock hearing that was scheduled for this evening um, has been continued, and I believe it is continued to, was it February 22nd? 22nd. Yes. We, still to, we still have to open the hearing okay. and, and vote to continue it. Okay. So let me read off. Wetland dock hearing, Nicholas J. John S. Anthony P. Pentecus. James N. Penticus, Trust UDT, for permission to license, retain, and maintain existing um, two four by 20 floats in and over the waters of Eel Pond Canal, located at five Canapacet East Falmouth. Um, so this hearing will be continued. I guess we have to open it, continue it, and then close it, or close it and continue it. How do we do that, Mr. Jones? We can. We just open it and continue it. Okay, so um, opening the hearing, we're going to be continuing at the request of the applicant to February 22nd, 2021 at 7.30 uh, p.m. And unfortunately, I think we have to read the public hearing notice into the record. Okay. Does anyone have that right in front of them? I'm just scrolling through. Okay, if you could do that, please. Uh, the Falmouth Select Board will hold a public hearing under Section 240-77, Wetland Regulations of the Zoning Bylaws of the Town of Falmouth. On Monday, February 1st, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. in the Select Board's meeting room, town hall on the revised application of Nicholas J. John S. Anthony P. Pentinicus, James N. Pentinicus Trust, UDT for permission to license and maintain a, well, this is different numbers, this says a four foot by 35 foot float in and over the waters of Eel Pond Canal. There's an existing waterways license for the bulkhead, number 4471 at 5 Canapitsit, Drive, East Falmouth, area affected is Yale Pond. Interested parties may review the file in the hearing in the town manager select board office town hall. And this was published Friday, January 15th and Friday, January 22nd. Thank you. Mr. Suso, could you please check on that act? The, the two do not look the same. Maybe the agenda is just misprinted, but I want to make sure that whatever public notice we put out before, if we have to redo it, if it's not correct, I want it to be correct. This has been a long ongoing process. Uh, and I certainly want to make sure that our, our public notice is accurate. So if you could check that, please. I will, yes. Thank you. Thanks for pointing that out, Doug. Um, okay, so we are going to continue that till February 22nd, as previously discussed. Yeah, don't we have to mo move on that? Yes, I make a motion we continue <laughs> until Patterson February 22nd, second. 730. Patterson second. Okay, I have a motion a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. English Braga, aye. Great. Next, we have an application for transfer of an all alcoholic beverages, uh, common victor license, ship direct LLC located at 263 Grand Avenue, Falmouth. Application has also been made for the transfer of the entertainment and Sunday entertainment licenses. Let me just read this uh, notice, please. Notice is hereby given under Chapter 138 of the General Laws as amended that Shipwrecked LLC has applied for a transfer of an all-alcohol inholder license located at 263 Grand Avenue, Falmouth, Mass. Applications have also been made for transfer of entertainment and Sunday entertainment licenses. A hearing will be held in the Selectman's Meeting Room, Falmouth Town Hall on Monday, February 1, 2021 at 730 on the above application. Um, this is happening in accordance uh, with the governor's provisions, allowing us to uh, do this remotely. And this was published on January 22nd in the Falmouth Enterprise. So good evening, Attorney Clower. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, my name is Kevin Clower, and I'm an attorney with Ahmed Clower Law Firm here in Falmouth. Uh, before I start tonight, I see that we already have Rob Lowen pulled up, which I appreciate. Could we also pull up uh, Alex Kahn, who's on the attendees list? So I am here tonight representing uh, Alex Kahn in his uh, capacity as manager of Shipwrecked LLC. Uh, Mr. Kahn is under agreement for the purchase of the properties at 263 and 269 Grand Ave which is the BBC restaurant as well as the seaside inn that surrounds it. 
We are, uh, we've applied for a transfer of the liquor license, the entertainment license, and also the Sunday entertainment license. Uh, Alex and his wife live in uh, Newton presently, but he spent his summers uh, down here his entire life. And his wife, Renee, is an, actually a Falmouth native, uh, the granddaughter of the late chief Paulino Rodriguez. So they have a lot of familiarity with the town uh, and it's a, a place that is, that is very near and dear and important to them. Uh, as I said, they are under agreement with the purchase of this property and intend to continue operation of both the restaurant and the inn. Um, the existing manager, Rob Lowen, will be staying on as manager and uh, continuing in that role. And uh, Mr. Khan intends to keep the entire staff uh, as well to the extent that they all, the, the, to the extent that they want to. And it is my understanding that they do intend to remain. So what we're seeing is a rebranding of the restaurant potentially, but other than that, uh, no real changes to the operation. Um, and uh, just, you know, new hands and new blood and, and into what I think is a really important uh, location and institution in the town. Hope they don't change the pizza. <laughs> uh, you'll have to bring that up with Mr. Khan. <laughs> Great, thank you. I see a question from Doug Jones. Very quick one. Uh, can we vote um, all three transfers tonight or is this really only a vote on the liquor license? Um, let me just look back and see just what the notice. It did say all three. The notice read all three. So I do think that we can. My right. my understanding would be if, as long as it complies with the notice, which it does, it, it does point out uh, all three of them. Okay. Unless there's any public comment, I would move we close the hearing. Okay. Um, I'm second. just going to. Oh, okay. I just let me just let me just put it out there. If there's any public comment, anyone who wants to speak in favor or speak in opposition, please do so now. Well, we're waiting for that. I will just for a comment since this is the current manager. I don't feel as compelled to ask if he understands that as manager he is responsible for all liquor sales on the building premises. But I'm sure he is aware of that. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Can I don't see any comments. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sam. No, I just point out to, to Doug that we did receive the applications for all three licenses. Right, I just wasn't sure by our agenda that we could vote them tonight. Yeah. And, and uh, just if if I could ask that the, all three do be voted because the, it's really a condition precedent to the purchase of the property um, that, that these transfers take place. I think the only difference uh, is the final two don't need a hearing. Right, yep, okay. Um, I don't see any public comments. We did receive a few via email that were positive um, in favor of this. Um, so we had a motion from Mr. Jones to close a hearing, a uh, second from Mr. Patterson. Um, no, seeing no further discussion, um, vote, uh, please vote. Uh, oh, go ahead, Sam, I see your finger. I'm not sure that Doug Brown shouldn't recuse himself since he's got a vested interest. In the pizza. <laughs> he didn't say he gets free pizza. <laughs> It's late and you're hungry. That's how this goes, you know. Yeah. Um, all those in favor, uh, closing the hearing. Nancy? Taylor, aye. Okay. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. So the hearing is closed. I we have a motion the, to approve. Uh, transfer the all alcoholic beverages license, the entertainment license, and the Sunday entertainment license as applied for. Patterson, same thing. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Just one Seeing question. None by oh, go ahead. Sorry, has the entertainment license previously been Sunday till midnight? Is that what was happening before? Yeah. And it hasn't been any we, problems? We mirrored, we mirrored the existing licenses. All right, then. Okay. Um, seeing no further discussion, by roll call, please. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate your time tonight. Okay. Thanks. Good luck. Good luck. Okay. Next we have um, application for transfer for all alcoholic beverages, uh, beverages in holder license Seacrest concessionaire LLC located 350 Quaker road, North Falmouth application has also been made for the transfer of the entertainment license, Sunday entertainment license and automatic amusement license. So a similar situation here where we have the three um, requests in one um, application. I just wanted to find the, could someone just read that notice if they have it in front of them?
Notice is hereby given under chapter 138 of the general laws as amended that Seacrest Concessionaire LLC has applied for a transfer of an all alcohol common victual license located at 350 Quaker Road, North Falmouth. A hearing will be held in Selectman's Meeting Room, Falmouth Town Hall on Monday, February 1st, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. on the above application. Publication date Friday, January 22nd, 2021 in the Falmouth Enterprise. Great, thank you. Welcome this evening. Thank you very much. Let me just start by asking the board, we have all of the paperwork in front of us. Let me ask the board if they have any questions um, for uh, the applicant. I've lost who the manager is going to be. The manager will be Clark Gwynn, who is also the current manager. He will also be the future manager. Great. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Gwynn, you know, has done an excellent job and is well known to us for the work that he's done at the Seacrest and been really part of that transformation of that particular resort that it's undergone in the last many years, so uh, familiar face. So any questions for Mr. Gwynn, for Mr. Upton? I guess I'll just ask, is everything gonna stay the same pretty much? Yes, it is It is uh, our goal uh, that if you had a drink or a meal or a visit to the beach or a visit to the hotel last summer, and then you have one this summer, you will see no difference. Uh, Mr. Gwynn and his team are both staying on and uh, we consider the place a jewel and a gem and want to keep it as is. Sounds good. Uh, right. Just to be consistent, Mr. Gwynn, I noticed that you are, are not a Falmouth resident. Do you have any difficulty making sure you're at the Seacrest uh, enough to be responsible for the liquor sales? Uh, yes. Typically, at least a good, always seven days a week, normally 60 to 65 hours. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh. Great. Any other questions from the board? I would ask if there's any public comment who, for anyone who wants to speak either in favor or opposition to this, please do so now. I'd move to close the hearing. Okay, I have a motion to close. I have a, a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, by roll call, Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. I move approval um, transfer of the all alcohol liquor license the entertainment license and the Sunday entertainment license and the, uh, what is it, the automated amusement? No, the, what's the yes, last one? Automated amusement, right. Yes. Automated amusement, yep. Okay. Patterson, second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, please. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Thank you, gentlemen. Aye. Thanks, Hope Clark. Have a good season. Yes. Thanks, Thanks, Clark, for keeping everyone. things going. Thank you very much. Thanks for staying on. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Okay, next we have um, another hearing. Our next hearing is application for new all alcohol beverage common victor license. Train Bridge View LLC DBA Sweet Rice, located at 167 T Ticket Highway, T Ticket. Notice um, is hereby given under Chapter 138 of the general laws as amended that train bridge view LLC doing business as sweet rice has applied for a new all alcoholic beverages common victor license to be exercised at 167 T ticket highway T ticket mass. The hearing will be held in the selectman's meeting room Falmouth town hall on Monday, February 1st, 2021 at 7 30 PM on the above application publication date, Friday, January 15th, 2021 in the enterprise. Great. Thank you. And Randy Quinn and O'Connor here, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. Um, let me just ask the board. Um, we have the paperwork in front of us. Does anyone have uh, a question for Attorney Collette? Yes, Doug Jones. Uh, just a concern about this going with an all alcohol liquor license in this location. Uh, is there a reason they did not consider a wine and malt liquor license instead for, I would just think with this kind of, what they're typically are serving, it seemed to be more appropriate. And I'm also setting ourselves up for other establishments in town that are adding liquor to their business. I wanna make sure we're consistent in the questions we ask you as we will ask them. 
Uh, yes, thank you. I uh, like to believe that the uh, uh, that the last establishment that was there had a full um, had the uh, actual full license. I think that's what they were going for. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, I think that's accurate. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, and okay. has the manager uh, been the manager of an alcohol license before? Yes. Yes. Uh, lives in Falmouth? Uh, no, he is a born resident. Uh, but has no difficulty with making sure that as responsible for the liquor sales, he will be on the premises the majority of the time? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, any public comment in favor or in opposition? Please make your comment now. Okay, seeing none. I move we close the hearing. Okay, I have a motion to close the hearing. Anderson, second. I have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Um, and what's the pl this pleasures board as it pertains to this license? And as as was stated, they always had a liquor license every four, and I think it seems appropriate for the type of food they have. Okay. Is that a motion? I to move approve? approval. Okay. Anderson second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? And I don't see any public comment that took place. So uh, by roll call, please, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Good luck. Be well. All right, our last hearing for this evening, application for transfer for an all alcoholic beverage package store license. Uh, Ganjanan Package Corporation, DBA Falmouth Wine and Spirits, located at 322 Palmer Avenue, and I'll read the notice. Notice is hereby given under Chapter 138 of the General Laws as amended that Ganjanan Package Corporation, DBA Falmouth Wine and Spirits, has applied for a transfer of an all alcoholic beverage Package store license located at 322 Palmer Avenue, Falmouth, Mass. A hearing will be held in the Selectman's Meeting Room, Falmouth Town Hall on Monday, February 1st, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. And the publication date of this was January 15th. So welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good evening. For the record, uh, my name is John Kenny. I'm an attorney with the Law Office in Centerville. I come before you tonight uh, representing uh, Gajanon uh, Package Court. Uh, and appearing with me, uh, Neelish uh, Mafasha. Nim, Nim, Nimitabin uh, Brambat, uh, as you can see there in the lower right now, uh, okay. the two two owners of the company. They're acquiring the uh, business uh, located at 322 uh, Palmer Avenue, known as Falmouth Wine and Spirits, Inc. Uh, the, they'll do business under the name Falmouth Wine and Spirits. They're uh, acquiring the rights to use that name as a goodwill. Uh, employees, the, those current employees that are there that, plan, that would like to stay, the intent is to keep them. No changes to the inventory styles, no changes to the physical structure. N Nini Tobin will be the uh, manager of the, of the uh, store. Uh, she lives in Sandwich, but has no problem getting over there. She intends to be the full-time manager uh, at the store. She has experience uh, working at a grocery in North Carolina that sold beer and wine and tobacco products. Uh, she's familiar with the, uh, the, the rules and regulations and the requirements for identification. Uh, and she recently completed the uh, tips training Mr. Mafasha, the, her partner in this venture, uh, has interest in uh, other package stores, and he's familiar with the ordering process and training and license uh, uh, monitoring, et cetera. Uh, so with that, I'll be very brief. Madam Chair, I know you're trying to catch up on your agenda. We'll take any questions the board may have. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, maybe the attorney can help us out with this. So I guess our understanding is that you can't have more than uh, one liquor license per town. Uh, is there any reason we should be concerned about having so many liquor licenses around Falmouth, not necessarily in Falmouth? Not that I can think of, no, sir. So can you explain why we don't want to have more than one liquor license in town? Why you don't want to have more than one liquor? Well, I think you, uh, that goes back to your prior discussion, uh, you know, concerns about price fixing, um, sharing of alcohol between between facilities, which is not allowed. But, but uh, Dennis, quite frankly, the Falmouth aren't that far apart. So I guess I, why is it just across town lines 
aren't a problem, but in-town lines are. I guess I'm still a little bit leery about whether both those things could still happen just because they're not in Falmouth alone. Well, those things can happen with different owners as well within Falmouth that you could have six package store owners who get together and collude on price. And, and if they have inventory issues, they can it, it swap them. It's not allowed. It's not legal. Uh, so I don't think it's the town line that makes the uh, determination. It's the quality and character of the people. And uh, Mr. Marfasher and uh, Ms. Brambat have our high character and they will want to run a fine operation. Thank you. Just trying to get some information. And if you look at the uh, Mass General Laws, excuse, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, Mass General Laws, uh, they are loosening up the uh, number of licenses you can own, as, as this board is well aware. It's gone from, I think it was three at one time to, I believe it's now up to nine now. Yeah, it just went from seven to nine. Yep. Great. Any other questions? Okay, um, if anyone has opposition or um, a comment in favor, please make that now. Okay, not seeing any. Hearing. Okay. Anderson, second. I have a motion to close. I have a second, any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Uh, what's the pleasure of this board uh, in regards to this license? I move that we approve the transfer of the all alcoholic beverages license. Patterson, second. I have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Ooh. Seeing none, uh, by roll call, Taylor. Taylor, uh -huh. aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. English Braga, aye. Great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Attorney Kenny, and thank you to the applicants. Uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. Okay, that concludes our, our here, our public hearings. Now we're moving on to summary of actions. We have vote to accept donation in the amount of 100000 from an anonymous donor to the Conservation Department donation account for the Kunameset Greenway Heritage Trail and Gateway and future river restoration projects. Um, just a wow. tremendous. Thank you, whoever tremendous that gift. is. Yeah, Patterson, so move. Okay. Wow. Taylor second. Uh, I think Jones was, okay, Taylor second. Um, all those in favor by roll call, Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Thank you to that individual or individuals. That's wow, really that's a legacy incredible. gift um, that will be here for generations, so thank you. I'll have to put have... an anonymous plaque along the trail. Yeah, <laughs> thanks to anonymous. Um, Next, we have vote to accept FY 2021 traffic grant, municipal road safety program grant funding in the amount of 25,000 awarded to the Falmouth Police Department from the Executive Office of Public Safety and Securities Highway Safety Division. Anderson, so moved. Taylor, second. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, second. Oh, Patterson, aye. <laughs> Jones. Jones, aye. Great. Thank you. And great work for uh, Falmouth Police Department for who I believe it was the chief or whomever might have applied for that. Thank you. Yes, Vote sir, to here. extend lease between the town of Falmouth and the North Falmouth Village Association of the old North Falmouth Fire Station, known as Village Junction, to uh, 212 Old Main Road for an additional 10 year term. Uh, Mr. Suso, is there anything you want to? comment on for this particular item any i mean we have the information in front of us but anything else that we need to know just briefly uh madam chair members of the board uh, peggy heaslip who's the president of the north falmouth village association had asked for this uh consideration for the 10-year extension uh, this is an ongoing uh lease as the board is aware and if uh so authorized by the board it would extend the lease from october 21st of uh pardon me, October 31st of this year through October 31st of the year 2031. And the lease did require that notification of an extension be given uh, one year in advance. So uh, that is the reason that it would not take effect technically for several months yet, but would be a 10 year extension with the board's concurrence. Okay, any questions from the board? It's a great deal. Okay. It looks great like deal. the lease is staying exactly the same. I don't see any changes, so. Um, okay. Correct. 
Just like to note, it's very generous to uh, charge us one dollar per year and give us use of that building. I think that's what the cost is, isn't it? It's the other way around. Yeah, right. it's the other <laughs> way around. <laughs> right, we're, we're, we're charging them one dollar. One dollar a year. But so, it's a good so, use. Yes, and it's a beautiful building, and really just adds to that character, and it's well taken care of. So, yeah, and they're maintaining it at their cost. Yes, their at their cost. cost. Okay. Any other dis any other questions? Do I have a motion to approve? An ex uh, yes. Do a motion to approve. I move we approve and execute this. Uh, no, sorry, this lease. Extend the lease. Yeah. Okay. Patterson okay. second. I have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. By roll call, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Brown. Brown, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Okay. English Braga, aye. Next, approve and execute access easement to Lawrence Lynch LLC for solar project on Locust Field Road with a pertinent drainage and reserved area easement at authorized, I think it should say as authorized by Article 20, November 2019 annual town meeting. Any we questions on this? this? We discussed this a long time in town meeting or yeah. prior to yes. that, and I would move approval and execute the access agreement. Patterson, okay. second. Any further discussion? Oops. Seeing none, by roll call, Taylor. Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Great, thank you. Next, we have, uh, let's see, authorize the town manager to allow a one-time additional vacation carryover for ASME, union, and town's technical, administrative, and management TAM employees due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Suso, we have that in front of us. Could you just give us, a for the public, a Quick certainly. explanation of that. Certainly, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, currently, um, the non-union employees as well as the AFSCME employees uh, may accrue up to three weeks. Who accrue up to three weeks vacation may carry over one week of uh, said vacation into the next year. And employees who accrue four weeks or more may carry over two weeks. Uh, the town has received multiple vacation carryover requests beyond the po what the policy allows from employees. As a result of their not being able to take their vacation time due to COVID-19, we're certainly all familiar with the fact that town hall and all town administrative offices and operations remain fully open and operational during the entire pandemic. Uh, however, it was a year uh, 2020, as we know, unlike any other. So uh, we're, we're seeking authority uh, from the board for a one-time additional vacation carryover allowance for employees. Again, due to COVID-19, with the understanding that such additional vacation carryover time must be utilized within six months of the employee's accrual credit date during uh, this calendar year 2021. And this would require the authorization of the board to allow me to do that uh, to employees on a one-time basis. I think it is appropriate and warranted given the uh, incredible circumstances we've had, and I would so recommend to the board. Thank you for that explanation. Um, any discussion? Um, do I have a motion to approve? Yeah. I, I move that we approve this carryover of vacation benefit. Okay. I would second. Okay, I have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, please. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Brown? Brown, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Hey, English Braga, I. Great, and thank you. And, yeah. and, just, and thank all those employees who were putting in that extra work and yeah. sacrificing the opportunity to take that vacation. Hope that they get to use it better. Yes. They, they, <laughs> actually, they can go places now. Indeed. Yes. And be used more wisely, we hope, in the uh, coming year. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next, we have um, our discussion update on COVID-19 issues. If we could bring in um, Scott McGann. There he is coming in. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening, everybody. So you guys ready for an update? So let me uh, yes. take the screen. Who is this guy? Uh, <laughs> He's new. <laughs> do I get frequent flyer miles? Uh, <laughs> all right. So. I'm going to start talking about the vaccine because that's where the confusion is right now. Um, and I wouldn't lie to you and say it is confusing. It's confusing to me because things do change. Um, 
you know, I've been on every call just about with the state twice a week. And we were on a mid-February sort of rollout to phase one, I mean, to phase two, until the governor came last week and said, we're going to bump that up. We're going to change it up a little bit. But um, quite frankly, there's not enough vaccine in the pipeline to really do a whole heck of a lot at this point. So um, vaccine is in very, very short supply. It's going to remain so as far as I've been told for at least the next few weeks. Uh, the state does have control of the vaccine, sets up the rules, and it is an online registration process, which uh, getting to the next slide would be for those over 75, there's going to be a lot of difficulties registering online. Not everybody's going to have that opportunity. So that's, the state and the, our, us here at Falmouth are working on having uh, registration help on a local level and at the state level um, to a lot, help people register online. Uh, it's how the system tracks uh, vaccine. So if you if you have a clinic that does 500 uh, doses of vaccine, you'll be guaranteed 21 or 28, depending on which vaccine you get, days later to get another set of vaccines for those individuals. And it's an online system and they'll be tracking, um, which in theory works great, but there was quite a few bugs. Uh, Prep mod is the term that the state of the, the program that the state uses um, had just gone live maybe a few days prior. And you know, so I've taken the prep mod training and my staff's taken the prep mod training, Kathy, my, my nurse. And, you know, it, in theory, it works well, but there are some sort of uh, glitches and, and, and it's been a little bit of a difficulty with it. Um, there's also a call center, Barnstable County can set up a call center. That's the number 774-330-3001. Last week, they are averaging 2,500 calls per day. So a lot of calls. Uh, it's not to register people or put people on a list. Same here. If you call the health department, it doesn't really bump you up in the list um, or the senior center. Um, but, you know, there is no there is no wait list other than you can you can click wait list on when you do an online registration. Um, we're also working on a local local helpline as well. So Peter, Julian, IT, you know, um, everybody's working on getting a a, a local helpline uh, as well. And this would help us work on registration as well. Um, so the new phase, the new phase, if you haven't heard, is 70, over 75, which began uh, today. Then we jump to 65 and older individuals with two comorbidities. Then we work ourselves to some working groups such as uh, teachers, public health workers, and then individuals with one comorbidity. We're fairly close to being finished with phase one. So now we jump into, you know, the first bullet point, which would be 75 and older. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about registration. Um, the, the way that we were taught how it's going to be registration is the mass.gov COVID vaccine locations. And you can see um, you've got the different color stars. Uh, the, the red stars would represent uh, high throughput state run uh, clinics. There's currently nothing locally um, that may change. Um, right now, the closest one to you would be Gillette. Um, any of the blue line, the blue ones would be private sector, CVSs, Walgreens. The closest one to us would be Walgreens. And then there'll be regional clinics like Barstable County. Uh, we have one at the fairgrounds. There'll be four uh, regional sites. The next closest one would be uh, over at uh, the Melody Tent, uh, Orleans DPW. Uh, and then one further down Cape at one of the beach, uh, the big uh, seashore parking lots. Um, unfortunately, and I don't have any control over this, and neither does the county, that the, the green star never showed up. So I don't know if you've been hearing that on your uh, from some of your constituents or some of the residents, that um, I, we don't have a control. And I'm not quite sure why uh, the star has not shown up there. Um, but there should be a star there to show Bonsable County Fairgrounds. And what you would essentially do is uh, push uh, the star, and that's how you'd work yourself through the registration. It would show whether there's any... Um, Sorry, I keep getting the buzz. It would be showing you where, where you'd be able to register and show you the different sites. So how this is working out, and this is how we're working it, is that we're going to have a, a pretty good, robust uh, throughput at the uh, Barstable County Fairgrounds. Uh, our first uh, registration was for this past Wednesday, which a lot of people missed because the star wasn't up, but it only took an hour to get the 600 doses registered. About an hour, they were full. Um, well, we could run that five days a week and, and do roughly around 600 to 700 cars per day. Um, obviously we can only set appointments on prep mod for those times that we have vaccines. So if we get 600 doses, 600 slots would show up to register um, through the state. So if we got 3000, we would run 600 a day for five days. 
So we can run that up to five days a week. We have 35 nurses at the county for the four clinics, plus around 200 volunteers. And it'll be a mix between the two of them coming to the clinic every day, plus CERT uh, volunteers and different volunteers to work on the, um, the traffic flow. Um, so that clinic is going live uh, for this first 600 doses uh, on Wednesday. Um, in addition to that, um, we will also need to run uh, Falmouth focused local clinics as more va vaccine becomes available. So the, the uh, framework that we have is that Barnstable County, as they get more and more doses come in, we would have the regional clinic and then we would uh, filter out some of the, some of the vaccines. So let's say there's a lot of vaccine and we get more than we need for the cl regional clinic, you know, that would be able to use at the regional clinic at a reasonable time. We could also run uh, at our other emergency dispensing site, which would be the high school. And then we could run additional clinics in the high school um, and make those more private towards Falmouth residents. And then as the vaccine kind of moves its way in, you also have the VNA. So our VNA is what our nursing uh, contract is with on an annual basis. Um, it's what we've always used for our nursing. It's who does our flu clinics. Uh, the VNA would be is going to be better used for uh, the homebound special populations, those that can't get to clinics, uh, senior housing, things of that nature, more discreet defined uh, sort of clinics. So the role with the VNA would be to use them, basically to use the county for the larger and then use the VNA for the smaller, more focused, uh, fine-tuned uh, type of uh, vaccinations. Um, to, you know, I've gotten a lot of calls this week that we're not ready. We are ready to start vaccinating as, as, as vaccine arrives. Um, it's just, we don't have a lot of vaccines. Uh, the other thing I want to say is each day, this I, mean, I don't know how often the state refreshes this website, but you're going to see a lot more stars and a lot more opportunity as time progresses. They haven't had any private ones other than the Mashpee Walgreens. You'll start seeing more stars in port. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of like trying to get, uh, you know, uh, Taylor Swift tickets for your teenage daughter right now. It's kind of like you have to go on every day and sort of keep looking for new sites and new opportunities. Um, it's something that you're going to need to check on a frequent basis. As vaccines become more available, obviously there's going to be a lot more appointments, but you're going to go online and you're going to pick your appointment, register that way. Um, the other website that's also functional is massimmunizations.org. Um, I went on it today to do this slide. You can see I've circled, you click on vaccinations, seniors and adults, search by Falmouth, and then the Barnstable County Clinic comes in. It shows no available appointments because they went with an hour. An hour. Uh, this went live, but the, the chart didn't go with the star. And I didn't even, you know, the state was saying just going to go to have one website. It really only makes sense to have one website. But again, because it's the state's vaccine, we have to work by their rules. Um, it's the system. And then you would click up and sign up for a vaccination. Again, it would only be those over 75. Um, if you click on, um, this is the example, if you had clicked on the Bash P. Walgreens, you come into here and you start clicking through, they actually have their own. So they don't use that prep mod. They have their own. CVS will probably have their own and, and Walmart or whoever ends up joining into the, into the mix. Um, so you'll have different ways. And what you're going to do is you're going to just keep, again, let me go back to the stars, click on the star, it takes you to the website and you register that way. Um, and then that also, guarantees, like I said before, guarantees the clinic to get that second round of dose uh, coming down the pike. But you still do have to make a reservation. So there's a lot of um, clunkiness, uh, unfortunately, in the website that they need to work through. For example, if uh, a husband and wife want to register, they kind of have to go through the system. I think they might have fixed that. I've heard they may be fixing that quickly um, to like register two at a time because I only want that car to come through once with two people. It's a heck of a lot easier than if we have to have somebody go back through the line. So there's a lot of little sort of things that they have to sort of tweak out and, and they'll get there. Um, so in terms of the fairground site, the fairground site, here's the map for the fairground site. You're going to come in off of Courier Road. Uh, Chief Dunn's taken over with, with details. Um, we're going to come in and you're going to go down by the entrance and there's going to be a gate attendant that's going to check to see if you're registered. This is always by registration, registration only. Um, it can't be the first 600 to show. Imagine what 151 would look like if we just said first 500 to show up. You can't do it that way. If it didn't, if you don't have an appointment, we'll send you back out Courier Road. Otherwise, you're going to come through here. Uh, Peter McCarty and the DPW helped uh, fix this road up a little bit. This had a little bit of issue. You're going to come in through the shed here. There's going to be two to three rows, depending on the amount of vaccine and, and uh, uh, multiple nurses. Um, the, we're going to get Pfizer for this particular clinic. Pfizer is a little bit more difficult. You have to reconstitute it. 
and you have only five doses per vial. So it's a little bit slower to go a clinic. I, th I think it, it with the Pfizer than it is with the, with the Moderna because there is some extra work. So extra nurses have to be in to sort of uh, to set it up. Then you're going to come here to the thing I call the holding pen, which will be actually, in, uh, there are going to be vertical lines in this direction. We have to hold you for 15 minutes. The, the fire chiefs of, uh, of, the, of the upper Cape towns that will be involved with this will be, will have someone here to uh, administer help if they need it. All right, you honk your horn if you need help because we have to hold you for 15 minutes and up to 30 minutes if you had a previous reaction. Going to come out this way up to the um, uh, the Schumann Road gate up by the uh, where they do the demo derby. You could take a right to go to Mashpee and Sandwich. You take a left to go through Falmouth. We'll have it blocked off over here so the traffic can flow and not clog up Courier Road. Um, and so we're going to that, that's the clinic in a nutshell. Um, and like I said, there'll be Falmouth, uh, there'll be high school clinics. There'll be clinics as more vaccine goes in to keep keep going uh, through. This will be a standing one. Barnstable County is going to order the vaccines for that. Barnstable County, if they do a clinic for us at the high school, will also order through them. The VA, Our order number with the vaccine unit is with the VNA, and we can also order through them. So I'm trying to keep all the options open by using the two big entities in town that we have on the Cape, which would be the Barnstable County, uh, which has, like I said, the, the Bank of Nurses and also the VNA as well. Um, so what the VNA has been doing is um, transitioning some contact traces and training contact traces to free up the nurses to be able to do this because what's been happening now is your contact tracing was done by the nurses. Um, so that's it on vaccines. Uh, of course, you'll have some questions. Let me talk about the cases a little bit. Um, you can see we had a couple of bad weeks. We had three bad weeks um, of 90, 110, and 84. Uh, this particular week, we're uh, halfway through it. Uh, we've got a count of 27, so that's an encouraging sign to be lower than those two, three previous weeks. Uh, I didn't give you any slides on the state. The state is on a downward trajectory. We've had a good week or two. You can see the percent positivity and so forth diving down a bit. Hopefully, we're on the same trajectory. We have been red for two consecutive weeks, uh, although we went down from 5.81 to 5.5. Um, so we have percent positivities went down and, and actually these numbers over the last week of driving it will drive it down a little bit further. Hopefully we're below back into the yellow, but uh, we'll see by uh, by Thursday. Um, so I'll leave this up if you guys do you guys any particular slide if you want me to go to or if you have any questions. Thank you, Scott. Um, if people just want to jump in with questions, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, <clears throat> look, uh, just on behalf of the teachers and the students, I know they're going to be phase two also. Is there any organized way that I like, you know, Cape Cod Healthcare basically went through their staff and arranged for them to get scheduled for vaccination. Is okay. there going to be an opportunity for the school system to do that for staff? Yes, uh, and yes. Potentially for students? Uh, well, first off, it's only approved for 16 and over. So it wouldn't necessarily be the students. Okay. That's mm -hmm. your, you know, we know, we know it's, it's really the adults that get hit harder. As far as um, there's been talk at the state level that vaccine could go directly to the schools and they could do it on their own. That's been talked about. Or we would use either the V, I'd probably use the VNA and use our order number with the VNA to get the data, you know, the 550 or so employees and come down and do a private when it gets to them. You could do that. You can, the school could set it up, do all the logistics, and I can, we can get the vaccine and the nurses. The, perhaps the nurses could do their own um, as long as all we had to do was procure the vaccine. And uh, so there's a lot of those details that keep getting worked out as time progresses and things, unfortunately, do change pretty quickly. So you have to be fluid yeah. with the whole thing. Right. No, um, I, 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 I did I not. Managed to, I managed to figure it out for my cohort and for my wife's cohort. So, yeah. But uh, but no, for, you know, the, 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 t the schools are struggling to get coverage for teachers when they're out for whatever illness because they're required to not come and work. Uh, so you'd like to see them get processed on a. A more, they're sort of an essential worker in my mind, and they ought to deserve some special accommodation. That's well, they why do I fall. The they do fall as essential. If you go, if I if I share the screen, that that third bullet point after sixty five is is all your essentials: your your food handlers, your teachers, uh, public health workers, uh, DPW uh you know that type of thing. The people that were considered essential at the beginning of the pandemic fall into the category. All right. Thanks. Anyone else? I know, oh, go ahead, Doug Brown and then Nancy. I think Nancy had her hand up. Oh, okay. So, Doug Scott, Brown. Is, is there any indication of who's holding all the vaccine? Is it the federal government that's holding up the state or is the state, where is it all? Do you know? Don't know. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, the governor thinks he, the governor said he was going to try to get a hundred thousand per week, but you know, and look, I mean, honestly, if, if, if we got a call that there was an extra thousand, we can handle it. Like, so we'll, we'll take it and give it, um, a lot of the details, you know, still have to be worked out, especially, you know, with special populations such as homebound is mm-hmm. a real difficult thing. Um, uh, but we'll get there. Right. Yeah. I just don't know where the vaccine is to be honest with you. And this vaccine that we have is Pfizer, like I said yeah. before, and it's really because our ability at the at Cape Cod Healthcare and also Sean O'Brien at the county has ordered another deep freeze, has ordered a deep freezer. Then mm-hmm. we have the ability to handle it is the reason why we got the 975 for the entire county last week. So uh, I think I think what the governor is essentially doing is going to the areas that's had the highest infection. You know, you hear a lot, you know, like Chelsea and uh, North Shore and Suffolk County and Meadowsex. I mean, most of it's going that way. And a lot of it's going to the larger clinics like Gillette. There's been more more opportunity to get one at Gillette right now. They get one here at the fairgrounds. That's really not the local, you know, it's not, the county has nothing to do with it. It's the state's determining allocation. Right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and, and obviously we've heard, I mean, it's just, it's, there's a lot of room for improvement, right? Uh, you know, and then we get down to, to us and we're just sort of with our hands out doing the best we can and, and asking, but not, um, you know, not a ton of control at the local level. So even the state um, level, even the state's yeah. going to, you know, the state's yeah. going to get what they get from their feds. And, you know, and of course, you know, it, it, it makes us look, you know, like I wish I, I could tell you more. I wish I had more other than telling you to be patient. It's not what I want to be able to tell you, but. Right. So a lot Anything, of people. Oh, oh go ahead, Sam, lot, and then Julian. It's a lot of people that need to be vaccinated, so there's going to be some inefficiencies. Twice. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's, Julian. That's, Certainly. Uh, thank you. I think uh, somebody inquired about a potential wait list at the fairgrounds. I just wanted to affirm there is no such thing as um, a wait. As yeah. Scott has said, you just need to go continually. Be patient and get back online and attempt to register, but there is no wait list. And I want to underscore that uh, for anybody that has a question about it. Yeah. There's a function for a wait list. There is an option on it for a wait list, but I don't necessarily, it's not set up where it automatically puts you in the next grouping for five. It, it, I don't know why it's on there because it's not functional in my opinion, because it doesn't really generate what I would recommend right now, subject to change at a moment's notice, just, before warned is to go ahead and put yourself on the wait list because if it's functionality works, it works, but still keep trying to register every day. So don't rely on, I'm waiting for some entity to send me an email that we're already off the wait list. When you saw a bunch of appointments go by that you could have made. So if you can still put yourself on the wait list, um, on the radius of what you can do. So when four C's comes up or you can handle going to Gillette, put your name on all the wait list by all means. But if you find that you have an active appointment, because for some reason that, you know, we got a miracle amount of doses come in real quick and went up real quick, register yourself again. Okay. That's what I'm, you know, but you, to clarify, you can't call the town to be on a wait list. All right. It's good. It's all online. This is wait list that would be from clicking on, um, the system and putting yourself on a wait list. Just, I might yep. mention some, something. I, I mean, I managed to get scheduled through one of the Walgreens, um, and I, I noticed that what they're doing is using a kind of a moving window based on how many vac- vaccines they have available to actually you know, inject in people. Um, and and I was on trying to get into that last day of the window, right? And the next day I went in. And when I went in, which opened up another day, it still said there were no vaccines. And I kept trying for different days further out. And then all of a sudden it popped up and took me back to the very end of that week that they were in. And all of a sudden I could have, you know, any of about four or five time slots. So they are constantly updating it. So keep that in mind when you're trying, uh, literally from hour to hour, things can change. So could I ask Sam, how far do you have to travel? Uh, I found I got a, a scheduled appointment in um, Hyannis, but my wife had to go all the way to South Yarmouth. But she was in phase one, the end of phase one, as a home health care uh, person. Yeah, she went to Orleans, right? Oh, she found one in South Yarmouth. That's good. She got the, the CVS in South Yarmouth is where she got vaccinated and yeah. infected was today. Okay. Just, just just keep in mind that more stars will pop up and more appointments will pop up as more vaccine becomes available. 
it's just that real difficult. And H one N one had was not quite this bad, but it was it was it was hard to get a vaccine at the beginning H one N one, and then when the floodgates opened, we were doing fifteen hundred at the high school in one day. So I mean, you know, we can get there. It's just getting getting the product. So you just got to be patient over the next, unfortunately, several weeks. Hopefully, not longer. Um, so Scott, is there anything that we can do to urge the State Department of Public Health to put our fairground on the map? Maybe that would. Uh, I, we've communicated. I think maybe they only do a weekly refresh. Maybe because it was Thursday, whatever. If it went on Thursday and they only do a refresh, I don't. I don't know. I have I brought that up. We have brought that up um, because you can again. You end up going through the massimmunizations.org and not through the site that we've been trained to tell people to go on. So, you know, it's kind of like a back door a little bit. It seems like to me. And you had to click on adult and senior, and that's why I I ran through it today to try to put it on that slide to, so everybody can see. Seems kind of crazy to me that we've put all this effort. You know, the county has put up this site and coordinated with Cape Cod Healthcare, and we get this really great idea and no vaccine. But yet, all the private drugstores around the area are able to to get it. Why is any idea for that? I am staying in my lane. I have no idea why. <laughs> okay. Well, there, but the private uh, pharmacies are only letting you schedule out a week at a time. So they're, they're waiting for the commitment to get more vaccines. And of course, they have to take care of their first dose people and plan for the second dose, folks. So the, way they this have is going, the way this is going, I'm very uh, kind of anxious about the fact that people need their second shot within a certain time frame. It's but be... they, they're apparently planning on that because mm -hmm. of the way they're scheduling. So they're, they've obviously holding back a certain number of doses for that second dose. But, but when that's you make... what, they're supply driven, you know. When you make your appointment, do you make a second appointment at the same time? Sometimes, but when I made my appointment, they said none available, but they're supposed to contact you to arrange it. So okay. once you get in line, they should be getting back to you. That's how I understand it. But I'm like okay. Scott. I'm in I'm somewhat in the dark myself. Right. Everybody is. Everybody is. I mean, so that's why we try to do this each week to at least get a weekly update. You know, I mean, Scott's doing those updates and providing that information as he gets it because it is just, you know, it's changing daily and weekly. So at least yeah, we're had, here share, sharing the fact that we don't have that much information. I had no idea that the governor was going to do what he did on Monday. Right. Yeah. And move everything up. I, it's exactly what the state was saying was not going to happen on Friday. So it's been difficult. Yeah. He caught it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. unfulfilled yeah, expectations are the worst kind yeah I, I, right. I, and any other we won't put scott on the on the spot because he wants to say <laughs> we, we want him to be the, the <laughs> smiling face for our town so we can continue to get whatever is available any other questions for scott scott yeah. thank you so much as always you really appreciate it thank you you're welcome all right take thank care you, scott. Um, next, we are going to discuss, uh, it says discussion and vote, um, affirming site for the future new fifth fire station at 860 Sandwich Road. Um, but I would like to propose that what we do tonight is that we discuss this and we vote it at the February 22nd meeting so that we have time to take public comment. This is a, this is a big project. Um, and I know we also want to get some feedback from the rec committee who will be meeting, I believe, on February 10th. Um, because this proposal impacts um, and is near uh, recreational committee, um, you know, some fields. So we want to um, be able to get some input back from them as well. So I had talked about this just in advance with Mr. Suso. Um, and so if it's this board's um, concurrence, we would like to have the discussion tonight, encourage any public input for that period of time before we come back on the 22nd of February to vote. Absolutely. If that's okay with this board. Um, okay, Mr. Suso, are you going to um, kind of kick off tonight's Certainly. discussion? Uh, happy to have some comments, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the board. As you know, with your um, board packet is a significant amount of information. I'll try and just give uh, some general summary comments. Um, obviously, there's a lot more detail we can go into, but as you know, you had a um, had convened a citizen's a committee that looked at this uh, concept of fire station location. And I believe at least one of the uh, co-chairs, Tricia Favulli, is uh, an attendee. So maybe uh, Tricia might care to join us as a panelist if it's 
appropriate. Uh, they made their recommendation, of course, uh, um, back late last year uh, to the board and had a, uh, a primary site recommendation, which was the uh, central Hatchville uh, site on Sandwich Road. And I uh, worked with um, uh, Tricia in following up recommendations of the committee. I was able to attend uh, all but one of their meetings and um, uh, looked at the most feasible alternatives and uh, determined that uh, the most feasible one is actually uh, the property that's on your agenda this evening, which we've given a, an address of 860 Sandwich Road, which is uh, on the southernmost undeveloped end of the 14 acre uh, parcel that the town owns and that is under the care and control of the uh, select board by town meeting vote uh, for uh, municipal purposes. And uh, again, this is in an area that is currently vacant and uh, primarily uh, wooded uh, north and west of there. We have parking area for the Sandwich Road fields, as well as uh, two active recreation fields as the board is aware. And uh, this is the, again, the Southern undeveloped portion uh, adjacent by property line to the Unitarian Church and nearby the uh, Falmouth Temple as well. And uh, the uh, concept would be if the board would be agreeable uh, that uh, we would proceed with a suggested lot split uh, for a, a section of that property that would be attributable to fire station construction. And we could begin uh, through the procurement process. You also have a uh, proposed warrant article among the 40 articles you'll be considering under the next item uh, later in your agenda. That includes uh, the set aside of funds for uh, project management design and some construction funds as well uh, for this potential site. So I'd be delighted to uh, uh, have uh, Tricia Vavuli make some comments as well if uh, that would be appropriate. Great, thank you. Thanks for joining us. You're going to have to pantomime whatever you want to tell us. There you go. You're you're unmuted. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not using my regular computer here. No problem. Bear with me a second. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, I just wanted to just quickly just go over what the group did. Um, it was a pretty quick study for everybody to come up to speed. Um, had a great group of citizens that were involved on that committee, spent some time going over that same location, going over the study, going over some Thomas Landers locations, um, and we immediately went to the sandwich location that um, Mr. Susu just spoke about. Um, it's a great site. There's good distance sight lines um, going north and south um, so that they can get into those areas that were in the red zones and also quickly get into other areas in town if the need be. So location is perfect in what the needs are for the fire department and for the citizens for that location. Great, thank you. Any questions for um, Ms. Favuli? Obviously we got the report from that committee which was really excellent and thorough. Um, Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, I have a question about uh, when we would do the capital exclusion uh, because uh, I noticed that, uh, that Julian had recommended waiting until May of next year. And uh, since we don't have to borrow the money right away, it seems like we really should be thinking about doing it this year. And, I, and the reason I raise is it because interest rates are very low right now. And if we were to see things progress and we could see that interest rates were gonna climb, it actually might be better off to borrow the money or start the process to borrow, get a commitment and even pay some interest uh, in order to take advantage of low interest rates. Uh, so I, you know, we don't have to issue bonds immediately. We can kind of sit on them for a while, but I, I think this is in the forefront of everybody's mind. 
Uh, and I think that uh, there's prudence to maybe think about putting a, a, you know, a referendum on this May's ballot rather than wait until 2022. Go ahead, Julian. Yeah, a couple of things, um, Madam Chair and the Select Board Member Patterson. First, um, we have Fire Chief Tim Smith and Finance Director Jennifer Mullen also. Great. In our yep, attendees. If we could bring if them in. Added in uh, as panelists. I think that would be helpful if that would be appropriate. Um, the uh, one of the things, as 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 you noted, uh, uh, Select Board Member Patterson, the, my suggestion was uh, a debt exclusion for construction to be considered in May 2022. Um, the reason, primary reason for that, and I can have welcome Jennifer's further comments as well, is that we do not have a solid construction cost estimate for the fire station. We really should have that in place prior to going for debt exclusion. And we need to go through the um, construction management and design process to secure that. And as it is, we would need to expedite uh, the process in order to have that figure. So I don't know if Jennifer, if you might want to make any comments on that, if that would be agreeable. Um, sure. Good, e good evening, everyone. Um, you bring up a, a great point, Sam. Um, really, the plan is right now is to put an article on town meeting. It's part of your warrant. And we will um, ask town meeting to appropriate some funds for some um, project management. We have to hire the project manager before we can hire the architect. He has to be on board. So we'll put those funds in place, hopefully, if town meeting agrees in April. And that will be funded from free cash. Through that process that will probably take about a year, we will get a um, hopefully a good construction cost estimate. And so the plan would be to go to um, town meeting in May of 22 for the debt exclusion. One thing I do want to mention, you can, you know, get a debt exclusion and you can but you don't want to borrow money until you start spending it. Because if we borrow money and we sit on it and earned interest and we're not spending it, then what we have is what is called as arbitrage. And then what will happen is then we'll get, um, have to pay that back. Um, you know, it's against IRS rules and we'd have to pay it back. So really there's a big timing issue with construction projects. And that's why we um, are planning to proceed in this manner, which is, somewhat, you know, efficient and um, will speed up the process. Thank you. Doug Jones? You're, yep, there Another you reason I'd, I'd like to wait, this is something I did talk to Mr. Suso about, is before we go to the town asking them for this money, I'd like us to really have a real, very well-conceived plan for the next station also, that we have that mapped out and figured out so that we are saying, yes, we're asking money for this station right now, but we are, have it planned out as to what we're gonna do for the next station. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Nancy and then Doug Brown. And I had some similar comments kind of along that line. When I read the agenda and it says for the fifth fire station, correct? The Hatchville station? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that means looking at combining west and north, correct? Well, I don't know if we've if that decision has been made, right? So we know we have that shortfall in that part of town, but this board hasn't voted on that next piece. I think that's what Doug Jones is kind of raising. Okay, so my so yeah. that's what my question was because this is actually the sixth station if all stations operate. Am I correct? Because you have West, North, East, Woods Hole, Headquarters, Hatchville. Okay, so we're talking so thank you for clarifying that. So that this would be the sixth station and that it would primarily be servicing Hatchville. Am I correct? I'm just kind of trying to make sure I know what, what where we're going here. Okay. Sure, let me just ask, hold on. I just, for that last piece, I would just ask our uh, fire chief if he could just weigh in. Chief Smith, just on that last part that um, uh, Ms. Taylor raised about um, where Hatchville, that station would service. The, the proposed station? Yes. Yeah, obviously in the, the northeast section of, of town. So um, uh, on Sandwich Road to go to the Mashpee border, to the uh, joint base Cape Cod, and uh, along 151 towards the north that would accommodate, you know, those areas that uh, we have distance between 
the east uh, Falmouth station as of now. Okay, I guess I was just oh, hold on, I wanted, uh, hold on, Sam, I want Nancy to finish. Can I, just, can I finish my thought? So my thought was, if, if we're looking at Sandwich Road to service that piece, and there's any conversation about combining west and north, shouldn't we be making sure that we're looking at another site at the same time, just so that when you look at the big picture, we're making sure that we are continuing to minimize response times to the different areas? Oh, Mr. Uh, Sousa, uh, or Chief, uh, yeah. anybody? <laughs> Go ahead, Chief. No, I, I think that the discussion, you know, since uh, I have been uh, in this position and seeing everything that was, uh, you know, conducted with the committee prior, uh, there has been discussion about both, and obviously going back 30 years, this has been discussed as well. Mm -hmm. And now you're at a point where you allow technology and data to be able to uh, be brought into this recent report. And they're looking at that one area just based on obviously what everybody knows, which is the headquarters in East Falmouth Station where the majority of the runs are. So, um, you know, I, I think that you know, obviously the discussions about the Northwest were, were also made part of a recommendation by the committee, but their primary recommendation was based on what they were, uh, you know, um, their mission was by the select board to look at that one single fifth station. But I think, you know, Trish can, you know, affirm that, that they also provided what they stated was a secondary recommendation to the, to the Sandwich Road one. I think yeah. they did. I think I remember hearing that. Yeah. Hold, I just want to let hold. I just want to let Nancy. Did you have? I want her to be able to finish her um, any of her other comments if she had any others. Well, that was just it, and I, I'm not sure I got an answer to whether we should be considering two sites to make sure that we're citing the right one on Sandwich Road, and then if if that is the recommendation, I'm just trying not to be short-sighted. I guess is what I'm saying. Yep. So one more sandwich on Sandwich Road to to um, service Hatchville, shouldn't we be looking at where the best site for the west and north should be at the same time, so that we make sure that you know on your map where everybody's sort of serviced um, equally in terms of response time? Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Uh, Mr. Suso, do you want to comment on that? And I see Sam and Doug Certainly. and Trish. I'm, I think. I'm, I'm happy if it's the desire of the board to begin the process or. Uh, of uh, looking at a Northwest site. I do just want to distinguish uh, that that was the secondary site, as you know, uh, recommended uh, by the Citizens Committee. And uh, what I want to distinguish is that uh, the primary site happens to be a site owned by the town. The uh, second, th there are no companion sites like that in the Northwest section that are clear cut, fully owned by the town, controlled by the Board of Selectmen, there's a couple of things in tax title, but we've explored those. I've worked with uh, uh, Tricia and we have some additional work to do. Um, there are no clear cut sites the town could proceed um, reasonably rapidly for a Northwest station. So um, we, we do have a scenario where if it's the board's desire, you could look at consecutive construction rather than uh, a continuous construction of two stations. And once uh, the first station was completed, you could consider a debt exclusion uh, as early as um, the, I believe it's May of 2025, uh, which for a, a, a debt drop off in fiscal year 2028, that's something that I've been having some discussions with finance director uh, Jennifer Mullen about. So there would be, a secondary window for a potential Northwest station should the board decide to move in that direction. And the other caution I want to give is that we have been, as you know, we've been discussing a five fire station model. If the board wants to differ from that and operate six stations, you're going to need another permanent override for staffing. You're going to need at least eight additional firefighters. Um, the override, which was, we're so thankful was approved by voters is allowing us to fully staff five stations 
um, uh, with that approval uh, once we get those additional firefighters hired. So to jump to a six station model, you need another multiplier in there, which we have not been discussing. The board strategic plan recently adopted as well as the McGrath recommendation uh, was fully based upon the concept of a five fire station model, which of course, upon new station construction would then uh, require, as we've talked about, uh, once a new fifth station would be, would be built, one would need to be taken out of service. Otherwise, you're operating six stations and you need, you know, eight or 10 additional firefighters to do that. Exactly. That was going to be my next point. So right now, if I could, I'd just yeah, like to oh, say. Hold on, Doug. Sorry. Was Sam but, waiting? I'm sorry. Were yeah, I'm right? sorry. I'm just waiting. trying to do it. I'm just trying to do an order. So Sam and then Doug yeah. Brown and then Trisha, okay. if she still had a comment. So sorry, I just want to keep it in order. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to let Tim come in and tell me I'm off base, but I don't view this as strictly neighborhood fire stations. We're going to have assets spread around the town. And as the needs change on any given hour, those resources are going to get moved around to try to cover the probability where the next incident is going to occur. So I have to see this as we're trying to cover the whole community and do it in a way that's strategic, where we know from past history the most likely incident is going to occur. We're going to move resources around, much like we do today. And so I, I think we should get, I like this station location because that whole Hatchville, a Schumann Valley area has been underserved for a long time. And that's going to kind of solve that problem in a kind of a compromise because those, those assets could be moved over to West Falmouth immediately if there was a need that required more. I'd like to see how this goes um, after we get that Sandwich Road station up and operating, see how the call responses go. Well, maybe we should just leave the West Falmouth station there with a smaller truck in it and operate that as a six station model and don't have to go through the whole construction costs on top of staffing. So my, my feeling is let's see how this Sandwich Road station goes, see what the response times are, and then we can adjust accordingly in the next phase if we wanted to build a different fifth station that can, combines North Falmouth and West Falmouth or whatever combination might make sense. Okay. Uh, Chris, Doug did, you want, to, did you want to make a point before I go on? Well, why don't you go ahead, Doug, and then we'll let the chief respond to what you say as well. So we'll just okay. kind of be efficient. Okay, so in reading the report, now it seems to me that the McGrath report didn't have a six station option. Am I correct, Mr. Suso? They didn't have that opportunity to comment on a six station model, did they? Uh, yes, we discussed a six station with them and they felt that coverage with five stations, in fact, with four was reasonably good, uh, but a fifth station would be a bit better. If you look at the four station model, versus the five station model, adding the additional station from four to five uh, surprisingly reduces response time only by a very small amount. So yeah, we did have that discussion as a matter of fact. Okay, so when I'm looking at it, I'm getting a caution from the McGrath report. It says, before a new station can be located, elected officials must determine the level of service for their community. So we got to think about what we're creating if we're going to agree to this five station model and put a Hatchville station, I just honestly don't see how a Hatchville station compensates for losing the West Falmouth station. And it also says on page 20, decommissioning either Woods Hole station or the West Falmouth station will increase response times to those areas. It's, it's just common sense. So right now we have examples that have been given recently that show us that if West Falmouth is offline, the response time in that area is about 10 minutes. It's either nine, 10, it's in that area. And we have to think about whether or not that's really acceptable to us. And we're gonna be the ones responsible for it. So I'm, I'm personally not comfortable. And I feel like we need to be honest with ourselves and say, we do need the six station model. And it's gonna be another commitment, as Mr. Suso said, it's another eight people to hire. I don't agree with another override. I think that voters are very generous and supportive. I think what we should do is get the people hired that we have now on, you know, coming online 
and then go back and consider the safer grant program and you know get rolling with that so i think we just have to really talk about the whole broad discussion of what is our plan honestly and get it all clear before we commit to building this station because if we just go forward and build it and close west falmouth i personally think it's a mistake and i think we're putting people at risk and i think we have enough information on hand to show that we'd be doing that okay. i'll leave it at that Chief, for now th thank you chief did you want to respond to any of the the, the comments uh, from any of the members here no i i think everybody has very valid and and you know and in good concern uh regarding you know uh, where we're at right now you know based on the study i think sam made a very good point about the the overall town coverage uh the data and technology used in the McGrath report just looked at the, excuse me, uh, looked at the uh, station four as just not being uh, optimal only because of the uh, the district it serves. It doesn't, it, it was only doing the 5% of the calls. And the study that uh, the recommendation on the four station model that Doug was referring to reported that a central station be built closer to the headquarters station to, and to close Woods Hole and Floor, which, you know, Woods Hole is obviously a, a concern just like any other place in town. So uh, that would also be very hard to accept. So based on the study now, looking at that one area servicing and assisting with the two most active areas is where the study's pointing us right now. Um, but still, and I'm sure as as Trisha's committee noted, if there was a, a, a recommendation to go forward and looking at combining three and four, it was like it was right along the 28A Thomas Landers to uh, yes, um, you know, to Winslow Road corridor, and obviously there's not much availability there. You know, going forward, if you know, depending on on how you all you know want to start mapping out the future whether it's with the new station and, and doing a six station model or whatever we still have the concern with the west Island station being 90 years old which is going to require you know work if it was to be maintained in 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 time to come so that is also another concern and, and mr suso is right with regards to personnel um you know we're looking probably at 20 to 22 personnel per staff uh, per shift to staff six stations. So again, this is a, a, a long-term activity, uh, you know, for us to move forward. But I guess, so-, so Can I ask a question about that? Uh, go ahead, Doug. And then Trisha, did you want to weigh in at all? Well, Just so, real go, quick. Yeah, so go Chief, ahead, Doug Brown. Go ahead, Doug. So Chief, as far as firefighters go, right now we're starting at 14 per shift, right? Yes. And that leaves us too short because we're not able to staff West Falmouth. So honestly, I feel like we really need to find a way to get a commitment to have 16 at start of shift. I know we're short of people and it's not practical today or tomorrow, but I think soon it will be. And I think we need to have a, a discussion and come to agreement as to what we're really is going to be our staffing level. And I'd like to see us have solid 16 to start and make sure West Falmouth stays open until we come up with a better plan. And if we go to the Hatchville with two, it's a lot better than what we've got now, which is nothing. And so ultimately, even when we combine North and West, the recommendation is to have four people. So staffing West Falmouth with two and North Falmouth with two for now only makes sense because when we combine, it's gonna be four. And so I think we're headed for 18 anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, disagreeing with that at all it you know it's just a matter of us continuing on our on our path to get these personnel on board and you heard me say that over and over again and we're we're, we're on that path right now and um you know I, I don't know if it's you know summertime closer to you know to the early fall but when we do continue continue to get personnel and they become manpower in order to staff our our uh, our shifts, then yes, we will be able to regularly staff the West Elm Station. Um, Trisha, 
I um, just wanted to echo the, the group that we had together that did all of this work. We studied the McGraw study. That Hatchville area has been red for a long, 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 long time. Ten minutes, nine minutes, eight minutes, it's all life-saving, and it can happen in other parts of town. But the, the mission and the charge of the committee was to come up with a Hatchville location. We did that, and we did our votes in order so that it was very clear. We had one choice to come up with that location for Hatchville. We did that. The secondary um, vote that we took was the West Falmouth, North Falmouth. And as Julian said, it's very, very limited. Um, I've spent a lot of time looking at parcels from Winslow Road south to Thomas Landers. There's there's only three parcels that are vacant in that whole area. So that's going to compound the issue. Right now, we've got a location on Sandwich Road. It's um, a viable location, something we can work with, um, something that we can bring to April Town Meeting to move forth and at least deal with one issue that we know we can take care of in the shortfall and then go to the next location. That's just my opinion as a committee member. Thank you. Thanks, Tricia. Nancy, go ahead. And I guess I didn't have such an aversion to that piece. If, if I knew that there was a commitment that while we're doing all that, the West Falmouth Fire Station stays open. Right. We're doing which, which part? Oh, go ahead, Julian. No, as we're talking about um, the, the Sandwich Road site, and that piece. Yeah, yeah I just, I just want to underscore that everything is in process to do exactly what you described. We just need to get the firefighters hired. And, it's, and, and uh, Tim, Tim and his staff are working diligently to do that. We were very close to making offers for seven of the eight override firefighter positions. And the whole purpose of that is ultimately to be, to be staffing West Falmouth. That, that we keep, we've said that continuously, that's never changed. The, the whole thing about voluntary overtime is temporary. As Megan is well aware, that was, that was an agreement we worked out with the union to create a transition opportunity until these new positions were filled. And once they're filled, the, the chief, uh, chief Smith will be able to assign 16 firefighters each day to the requisite stations. Um, now, I, I mentioned seven and not eight, so we're still a little bit short in terms of problems with civil service, and we've you know had a couple of retirements as well and a, and a vacancy, so we have other positions to fill. But the point is we've been moving steadfastly and should be able to hire seven of those eight override approved positions and have been working on that tirelessly since it was approved. So I, I want to underscore that is part of the plan. Um, West Falmouth is, has always been intended to remain open as long as we could staff it. And ultimately, a decision will be, have to be made by this board as to whether you're comfortable with a five fire station model as a consultant recommended, or you want to you want to go with a larger number of stations and pay additional staffing to make certain that we're doing it properly. So that's the decision that would lie ahead. But uh, as far as staffing West Falmouth, everything is in motion to do that properly. And the chief and I can't have that done quick enough. Honestly, we we are uh, sweating bullets to have it done quicker rather than sooner rather than later. Believe me. And I just I want to just piggyback for a minute on Tricia. Uh, you know. I think you raise a good point, which is that building this Hatchville station, it, it's it's multi and Mark Finneran was just saying the same thing to me, just didn't, sending me a message. You know, it's a multi year process, right? We know that these these things, you know, take a while to build. So, you know, to be looking at that other um, challenge that we have in the Northwest region while this Hatchville station you know, this project is underway, I think those, you know, we can walk in and chew gum at the same time, and we should be, we should be looking at, you know, what's going on. And, um, you know, Trisha, I think raises really the hardest part of this, which is there is not a lot of land available, right? That, that is a, a section of town that we're limited. And so, you know, it is going to continue to be a challenge, but I would hate to see the hatch, you know, this Sandwich Road location, sort of put off indefinitely because I think we are, you know, we're we're just under servicing the town as a whole because of that big spot that's not, you know, being filled. Where when that when there's a call out there, everything is coming. 
it's going to take them that much longer to get back to answer other, you know, back to the station to answer other calls. So I really, you know, I hope that we take that feedback and are able to move on this while taking a look at that other, you know, that other challenge that I think the committee did weigh in on to some extent. Uh, Nancy and then Doug Brown. And I, don't, I don't disagree with you. And I think about um, building a new Northwest or somehow refurbishing West Falmouth. Um, I just don't want to make this a short-sighted, very expensive decision if we're not looking at the entire picture. And, and respectfully, Mr. Suso, I know and I believe that you and the chief have been looking to hire and um, I, and I know it's difficult and it's COVID. I, personally, I've been telling the public this since July, right? So I just think that maybe we're not putting the message out um, well for them to hear. Um, and I just don't think it's being heard or being put out. Uh, let me let me just have Doug Brown and then Julian. Go ahead, Doug Brown. Just, just a curious question about um, at the, maybe about four or five months ago, we received an email from a pr property owner in North Falmouth who uh, solicited us with a three acre plus property in the area that we had talked about. And I'm wondering if anything ever came of that. Did, did that get investigated, Mr. Suso? Do you know? Yes, it has been investigated and has been looked at from an appraisal standpoint and uh, has some uh, advantages and some disadvantages. Okay, um, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And did you wanna just comment? Um, well, yeah, if I may just yeah, interject. Go ahead. Because um, this has had a long timeline and it's understandable that um, uh, it hasn't been followed by everyone and uh, select board member Nancy Taylor makes a good point. I just wanna underscore that going back to when we had the joint meeting with the finance committee, um, yeah, you know, well, that was in uh, 2019. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2019, uh, getting my date straight here. Uh, prior to the override going on the ballot in May, May of that year, um, we discussed the fact that when the override was approved, it would take uh, nine to 12 months for us to bring firefighters on uh, in a normal year. And of course, uh, we are now about eight months into that process and remarkably, uh, almost beyond belief as far as I'm concerned, uh, we're close to being able to engage seven of the eight positions. Now that doesn't have them start as firefighters the next day, but we were still within that eight to 12 month time frame. even though the pandemic has slowed things down, the fire academy has been closed. Um, they have not been... Uh, providing entry-level civil service testing, that's been shut down. So the seven to nine that have been hired, uh, when I talk about uh, uh, extraordinary circumstances, uh, Chief Smith, working with his command staff and administrators, was able to identify seven candidates uh, from a very, very stale civil service list that uh, uh, we're very gratified have come through uh, very strongly and uh, we anticipate, as I noted, making a hiring decision for. But I want to underscore that this is all within the original eight to 12 month time frame that we noted in our written documents and our joint meetings as well. So while we're all uh, concerned and frustrated with the fact that it seems to take a long time, uh, this time frame was fully anticipated, which is why we knew we had to supplement it with temporary of volunteer overtime to bridge the gap until we actually, as uh, Chief Smith said, have these people in a manpower position to actually uh, staff stations and be qualified to provide emergency services. So uh, thanks for the opportunity just to, to uh, pass that along uh, once again. Okay, any other comments? Um, can we please bring in, I'll just, I don't generally like to read this, but Todd Taylor has one comment, so I'll just read it. Um, he's asking if West Falmouth, does that mean West Falmouth stays open after the new Hatchville station is built? Um, and I, I think he probably asked that and maybe the conversation, go ahead, Mr. Suso. Yeah, I just, I just want to underscore again, um, we've repeatedly said any decision to close stations lies with the select board. No chief makes that decision. No town manager makes that decision, nor has anybody suggested 
that anybody other than the select board are going to make that decision. And I think that's one of the things, one of the thing, matters that's being discussed this evening and, and uh, in an informed manner by the board. And all of these issues are in play. Uh, but the decision, to my understanding, that's been made is to move forward with the construction of a single station at this point in time and at an appropriate site and go to the voters asking for a debt exclusion for quality design that perhaps we can achieve some economies of scale on a second Northwest site over, uh, over a uh, perhaps a successive three to five years. And uh, again, it will be up to this board totally as to what you choose to do. It's also up to this board as to whether you wanna continue with a five station model or have a model with a different number of stations. It's your call as the policymakers and we'll find a way to make it happen. Uh, we just need the money to do it uh, no matter what you choose. Great, thank you. Um, and can we just bring in uh, Maury Harlow Hawk? She had asked to join the conversation. Then I'll take a comment from Doug Brown and then I do wanna move forward. We're not voting it tonight, so it will be on another agenda. Um, and I just know we have some other things that, and it's getting pretty late. So welcome, Maury. Yes, hello, board. Um, this is really short and sweet. I wanna thank you, um, first of all, for the support at town meeting for refinancing um, a spare engine for the safety of all the Falmouth residents and taxpayers. Um, it was very commendable and it was great to see the support throughout the town for the public safety. Um, and I would like to just clarify one thing um, that was um, made mention of, and that was um, by the chief that um, it was aired that he said there's a lot of misinformation out there. And just to clarify that, and I, I feel bad because it does seem like there is misinformation um, because there is. Uh, on October 17th, 2019, at the West Falmouth meeting, Chief Small states, and this is a quote, the fire engine at the west, at the end of the road is a piece of junk and at the end of its life, timestamp Falmouth Public TV at 1-30. On the 25th, 2021, at the select board meeting, Chief Smith states, quote, the truck that's there right now is adequate and mechanically sound for our mechanics. We're glad to hear that because that was, you know, when you get this information that's incorrect it's it is hard to know what is you know real news so that was good to hear so when you get two conflicting chiefs tell you two totally different stories that's why the residents of West Falmouth were concerned um, I think that the Hatchville station has never been in anybody's mind a debate that they don't need a station there. It's never been a debate since 1951 when the town hired a firm to do a master plan survey and report. In this document, it recommends a substation in Hatchville to create six stations in Falmouth and that the current stations are well located for the best response times. That's clear. I think this board, I, we've listened to you tonight and we really respect your opinions and it's been really nice to hear that you can see the problem with just swapping red zones. So this has been a wonderful hearing tonight. I thank you very much. Um, and I know that there's a lot more work to do, um, but I just wanna clarify why we were confused and now I'm not confused, but I'm glad that we are moving in the correct direction to keep West Falmouth open. Hatchville gets a station and we have six models because Chief um, Smith keeps saying that, you know, we have, um, you know, we're doing better with our consolidation. We may be getting more men there to the scene, but we don't get there very fast. We had Bauman's Beach was over nine minutes with a closed station that was sitting right there. And we just had one in West Falmouth today, a woman with a stroke, and it was nine and a half minutes. And she lived on 111 Old Dock Road. So having more men in one spot coming late is not as good as having less men come on time. So I'm glad we're keeping the West Falmouth station open until we can get this figured out. Thank you for your time. And I'm sorry it's such a late night. Great. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? I just would hope that when we come back to vote on the 22nd, that we can also vote a, sort of a comprehensive plan of what we're agreeing to. Maybe it might not be something that we can fully carry out forever, but at least we can come to agreement of what we think we're going to be doing or hope to be doing. Is that possible? In, in what you mean oh, as with far regard as... To, with regard yeah, to ahead. staffing at 16 as soon as possible. I don't know, I can't, we can't put a date on it, but, and also the fact that 
we would have to go to 18 if we wanted to maintain what we have and open the new station in Hatchville. I mean, I think we should have a, a real comprehensive plan to go along with what we're choosing to do, or at least as close as we can get to it. Okay, any comment from uh, Julian or Chief? Well, I guess what uh, what I'm hoping to come back to the board with is a proposed lot split that the, the board, with your concurrence, we can move forward with uh, what's on your warrant article for this evening as well and and move forward with a constructing a new fire station. Uh, beyond that, it would be the board's pleasure. Uh, what else you want to talk about or if you want to expand the discussion and expand staffing resources, we can talk about the dollars you're going to need to do that. I'd like to. I think we should talk about it at least. Okay. Sam? Yeah, it seems to me the way we should be doing this is we should be thinking about what the average response time is to every part of Falmouth and work toward that end. So I think the Sandwich Road site just makes an awful lot of sense right now. And if we can get that built, take a look at our response times and decide. Can we close one of the stations, be it North Falmouth, be it West Falmouth? Should we build that fifth station that basically services those two areas? Uh, but I think we can get there by just simply picking a, a response time that we, and it's gotta be an average time because there's too many factors that can throw this off. But try to look at what we would consider to be the responsible response time for every part of Falmouth. Yeah, I guess so. I, you know, I think tonight we've heard a commitment about, you know, getting to the 16 as soon as we have the, the staff to do it, keeping West Falmouth open, you know, nothing's happening until we um, at least, you know, build the Hatchville and see what's going on there. It's a little bit hard to commit to. I mean, that's still probably three years out. Yeah. You know, so beyond that, it's hard to know just what our budget is. It's hard to to know, you know, sort of beyond where we are now. So I think having this discussion, talking about and, and making it clear that, you know, there, there's a commitment to really reviewing what's still happening, you know, as the system as a whole, but in particular in that, you know, the area of Northwest, you know, quadrant as we're as we have this Hatchville coming online, I think we'll have some more, we'll have real data to, to look at, at at that point. So, um, yep. you know, I, I think we could, Doug, have a further conversation about it, but I just don't know if there's something that we can vote at this point. Do you know what I mean? That's so, so far out into the future. Oh, okay. And then I see Doug Jones and I see the chief. So go ahead, Doug Brown. It's, I'm supporting Doug Brown's idea that we need to if we're going to go forward with building this new fire station, we need to assure the town that we have a plan going forward. Either it's a six fire station model or it's building the new Northwest station fairly quickly. But mm -hmm. to build a Hatchville and then not have the manpower or the station to cover North and West Falmouth, I don't think we're going to get the support we want for Hatchville. And I'm, and not, so, I'm not talking about a yep. whole nailed down plan, mm -hmm. just a commitment to our intentions. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I, I would I would agree to that end only because this, as we stated early on, we've been discussing a lot of this for the last 30 years since the previous uh, report was commissioned in 1990. Um, that was done for different reasons, um, but there was a lot of information that was provided and it even focused on, uh, you know, the village concept of, uh, you know, our stations. Um, having having the direction and having the support and having a plan certainly go a long way for public safety. Um, you know, every day we try and ensure that our apparatus is getting, is, uh, is getting out there. But as you can imagine, we have simultaneous calls and we have a lot of activity going on. So, um, to guarantee a response time is obviously not gonna, it, you know, isn't, you know, in concert with, uh, you know, when an emergency occurs, we'll do the best we can to get, you know, to whatever site we need to get to. But um, but just looking right now, just, you know, while you guys are having your conversations before, I was just kind of Googling, you know, the uh, mileage between where this Hatfield station would be on Sandwich Road. And, you know, to go from, from the, like the Unitarian Church area, Station Three is about 5.4 miles. 
the backup ambulance right now to the North Drama Station, bless you, is from uh, the headquarters station is the second ambulance that's due up there. And that's 8.2 miles. You know, from East Alma Station, which would be the third due, is 7.7 um, miles. So that will make a difference. Um, having, you know, our station staffed and available makes a huge difference. It has made a big difference with the headquarters station, with the two extra personnel. It's made it a, a tremendous you know, um, you know, improvement in the East Falmouth area. And again, as you, as you go along and I'm sure Mr. Jones could, you know, attest to that, you know, we need time to have more data. The, the study that was done in 2020 was based on three years prior to July 1st, which had minimum staffing. After July 1st, that staffing, you know, starts at 14 and it's going to continue to improve. And so that should resonate into you know, improvements all, all around because we have backup right away. So I applaud everybody to, for this conversation. I, you know, I'll do what I can to provide information when asked. Uh, we, and, and again, you know, we've been working at, uh, you know, getting the staffing to where we are and I will continue to provide updates upon request. And I greatly appreciate the support from the citizens and from the board and, and Mr. Suso. Uh, it's 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 been a huge uh, you know assistance you know for all of us in the department. So I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Chief. So so what I might suggest is, you know, why don't we we'll have our discussion on the twenty second, and you know maybe we t I know that Trish, your group really was tasked with one thing in particular, but maybe, you know, we have the group tasked specifically looking in a deeper dive. I don't, you know, I think you guys covered the the landscape a bit in that Northwest area, um, but you know, why don't we, maybe we have some more information on what, if any sort of vacant lots, it sounds like there's a small amount of them, you know, really having a discussion about what those look like and trying to get some of that conversation started. We could um, do that. Does that make sense to the board? Sounds so good. we're starting to have that discussion? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you all for, for this discussion. Yes, Chief. Just, you know, because I we have all the annual reports here at the station. I was looking back in 1927. And <laughs> just to show you how this argument and discussion has been going on, 1927 at town meeting, they were arguing about a central fire station and making repairs here, and it got voted <laughs> down. So, so we're blaming those town meeting members well, from know, 1927. So it, it, I was going to say it's a tough crowd. That's all. Yeah. So. yeah. Just like with yep. the sewer planning, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but eventually here we are. That's, that's right. right. So we've got Progress. <laughs> we'll Thank you, it. Chief. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we are going to move on. Um, our next item on the agenda is we are going to take a look at. Um, we have a letter from uh, town moderator, David Vieira. Um, this is in reference to our upcoming town meeting. And uh, Mr. Suso, do you wanna just let us know what we need mm -hmm. to do for this? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in, in, in order to have the April 12th, 2021 town meeting be virtual, the board needs to vote that as recommended by the moderator. And uh, I would recommend uh, your consideration as well. Any Madam discussion from the board? Yes. I move the town of Falmouth hold its spring annual town meeting on April 12th, 2021 through remote participation. Okay. Do I have a second? I second that. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call please, Brown. Brown, aye. Taylor. Taylor, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Okay, thank you. Next, we are going to um, vote articles and execute the warrant for April 2021 annual town meeting. Um, so first, I believe we vote, we already voted the date, so let's just see. Okay, generally, have we been doing it like the, just remind me, we go sort of articles one through eight, and then we do it in chunks like that when we can, correct? Yep. That's okay. how we've done it. 
Okay. Um, so why don't we start? We'll just do it sort of by the pages because it's naturally delineated. I move we add articles one through eight to the warrant. Patterson second. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, by roll call, Brown? Aye. No, no, Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Okay. I would add move that we add articles 9 to 15 to the warrant. Patterson, second. Okay, have a motion and a second. Seeing no further discussion, by roll call, Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. I move we add articles 16 through 18 to the warrant. Patterson, second. Motion and a second. No further discussion. By roll call, Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Taylor. Jones. Jones, aye. And articles 20 and 21 are uh, actually articles 19, 20 uh, are. Uh, uh, that move we put them to the warrant, their request to the planning board. Yep. Patterson second. All those in favor by roll call. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Taylor. Taylor, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. Articles 21 and 22 are both petitioners' articles. Uh, we don't have much choice. I move we put them on the warrant. <laughs> um, second. Okay, I have a motion and a second by roll call. Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Taylor. Taylor aye. Jones. Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. And then, uh, Mr. Sousa, could you quickly uh, summarize what's going on with Articles 23 through 28? Because since they're coming on our request, I want to make sure that uh, this is the right time for us to be dealing with these. Well, 20, 23 involves the uh, suggested creation of a uh, public way. That's what they're uh, right. Yeah, Article 23 yeah. is fine. And 24 is a, uh, um, would eliminate an encroachment. This was brought forward by Public Works working with town council. We've had an encroachment problem on a, a sidewalk construction that is uh, uh, for uh, handicapped accessibility. And it would be most helpful if we could resolve that as well. It's, uh, you know, it's an ADA issue. That's a total of 173 square feet. Yes, it's uh, very small, but uh, important if we can put it behind it, behind us. Can I move we add articles 23 and 24 to the warrant? Patterson, second. By roll call, Brown. Brown, aye. Patterson. Patterson, aye. Taylor. Taylor, aye. Jones. Jones, aye. Okay. And how about, um, could you explain article 25, Mr. Suso? Yes, 25 through 28 all relate yep. to uh, uh, anticipated future um, wastewater lift station and easements for construction of the next wastewater phase. All four, 25 through 28. And they're timely enough that we need to do it at this meeting? Yes. And do we do we anticipate, oh, sorry, Sam, do we anticipate any of these particular parcels being, um, you know, problematic or challenging in terms of the objections? We're, we're currently negotiating with the property owners. Okay. Uh, working with town council. So okay. that's all underway and uh, we're not resolved yet, but we're guardedly optimistic uh, because a lot of thought has been given to uh, that this is the next step in order to move forward with the wastewater. Okay. Yeah, I will Any be on articles 25 to 28 to the warrant. Patterson second. Okay, all those in favor, Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Okay, we have articles 29. Through 33 are petitioners' 30, articles. Yep, okay. The movie had articles 29 to 33 to the warrant. Patterson, second. All those in favor, Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Okay, thank you. And articles 34 to 40 are all CPC articles. So I move we add articles 34 to 40 to the warrant. Patterson, okay. second. All those in favor? Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Thank you for, for that heavy lift, Doug. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
I so it on the, it is. yeah, it's, it's long. So um, just a reminder for, I see some of the petitioners in our list, your presentation of your um, article will be on at our meeting on February 22nd. So uh, I think I had reached out to the folks that had asked. Um, we don't have, uh, we don't anticipate you uh, speaking about them tonight. That'll be on February 22nd, okay? Um, and also just before I forget, Mr. Suso, can we please make sure someone attends the Recreation Committee's meeting on February 10th to discuss the um, fire station issue that we just finished talking about? so that they can have all of that information in front of them. They have some Certainly. important questions about how it can impact the fields and the um, playground that's slated to go there. So I wanna make sure they have access to um, all of that, if we could do that. Certainly. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, next we have approve 2021 annual license renewals. Common Victor, the Buffalo Jump, 277 Hatchville Road, East Falmouth. I would move approval. Well, I'll second it then. Okay. Motion and, and a second. All those in favor? Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. Okay. We have come to approval of minutes. I move that we approve and release for the pub for public access the meeting minutes of Monday, January 4th, 2021. Okay, do you have a second? Jones. Okay, all those in favor, Brown? Brown, aye. P Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. Okay. I move that we approve and release for public release, um, for public access, excuse me, the meeting of Monday, January 25th, 2021. Okay, do you have a second? Jones, second. Okay, all those in favor, Brown? Brown, aye. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Braga, aye. And we don't have the December 7th, 2020. Um, Mr. Sousa, it was in the agenda, but we don't have those minutes. Correct. Okay. Um, all right, <coughs> excuse me, individual selectmen's reports. Uh, we attended a transportation committee meeting last week and they have, uh, they're putting together a, a one-year review of complete streets and milestones. And uh, also they reminded me of having submitted comments for Steamship Authority that we hopefully will revisit at some time soon and decide if it's something that we want to forward on to the uh, Steamship Authority people. We did kind of held off on that, I think, because we were just starting to have these two new committees and wanted to kind of let that get started first, but maybe it's gone too long now. Just to tag into that, uh, the traffic and parking group for the Steamship Authority has asked that a representative from that committee join our next meeting, and they've already been notified, and Ed DeWitt's going to be a part of our meeting on March 10th. Great. Right. Any, uh, any other reports? Um, Sam and then Nancy? Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, quickly, uh, the Friends of Knobs, the Knobs, the Light, I'm getting, getting tired. Uh, their board met uh, on the 25th, and uh, they're still trying to work out how they can do this site work that makes the facility ADA compliant, um, and so they can get an occupancy commit uh, permit. And uh, it's the funding raising challenge right now because there just isn't enough funds to finish that up. I attended the school committee meeting on the 26th. Uh, they went through their budget, and it looks like strapped they will be but uh it looks like they're going to be able to fit within the guidelines that uh jennifer mullen and julian have pretty much set out as to what they can expect for increased revenues uh and you know we uh at the um, massachusetts municipal association meeting it, the governor and lieutenant governor pretty much committed to improving the chapter 70 funding which is what they supply to the various districts and then the last thing i did join the transportation management meeting on the 28th, uh, along with Doug and Julian, um, just to hear what was going on. They put the invitation out on it, so I, I accepted that. That's it, thank you. I forgot to thank mention you, something about that meeting that they had also, uh, they're putting together a survey of Main Street people about uh, parking. So just a little heads up about that. So please, if you get a request for a business owner 
gets a request for their questionnaire, please help them fill it out because they're trying to gather information. So that'll be coming soon. Great, thank you. Nancy. So just very, very quickly, and I don't know if the other select board members have um, gone through that new senior center, but they're one of my committees now and Jill Irving Bishop and Jim Vieira hosted a, a site visit for me. And that place is absolutely incredible. I cannot That's wait great. until they open the doors. That's my first comment. My second comment is, even though those doors are not open, the outreach that Jill and her team um, are doing is just absolutely unbelievable and outstanding. Mm -hmm. That's my right. reason. Yeah, thank you. And just that's a good reminder, you know, for seniors in our in our town, those services are still happening. So, you know, please reach out. It's still a resource that can help you with everything from your taxes to health insurance to, you know, meals really, on meals on wheels. Meals on wheels, everything. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Um, and Doug Doug Jones, you good? Did I miss you? You're good? Julian? Certainly. Um, I attended the uh, Finance Committee's virtual meeting this week. Oh, yeah. I January forgot that one. <laughs> and attended the, uh, as noted, Transportation Management Committee's virtual meeting this past Thursday and also their prior virtual meeting on January 14th. The board has scheduled a joint meeting uh, with the planning board set for the morning of Saturday, February 13th. Town Hall and Town Administrative Offices will be closed on Monday, February 15th for the President's Day holiday. And uh, this board's uh, next regular meeting, as we've noted, it will be Monday, February 22nd. That concludes my report. Thank you. What time are we meeting with the Planning Board on 13th? We haven't finalized that yet. Um, okay. My guess is 8.30, 9 o'clock, but it'd be up to, I think Megan will probably talk to Pat Kerfoot and finalize things the sooner we start the sooner we get out and get to that yeah. birthday party exactly <laughs> right <laughs> just uh, my only comment is i just want to say today's february 1st and it's the start of black history month and i really hope that uh, you know we just take it especially in this last year that we've had that we really celebrate it and um i ask my kids for each day of black history month to name some famous uh, individual that they can think of and what they did. And I just have to say, I'm going to brag for him that my five-year-old while she was in the tub said, that woman who's the second in charge of our country. <laughs> and so she didn't have her name down, but she knew. So um, those things resonate even with a five-year-old, um, you know, really those things are really important. So I hope we just uh, find ways to kind of reflect and, and work that into our daily lives. So that's it for me, but thanks everyone. Yeah, Good one. I move we have a motion to adjourn. Okay. Patterson I have second. a motion and a second. I got those. All in favor, Brown? Aye. Okay. Patterson? Patterson, aye. Taylor? Taylor, aye. Jones? Jones, aye. English Praga, aye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thanks, night. Guys. Nice job, Megan.